Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texas Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texas Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, right? man, 50-50 ball, I got to come down with You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. Well, that was a master class of a basketball game. Welcome to Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. The Go Hour, presented by who? CNC Creation. That is correct. CC Creation is here. Uh, Maroon never looks so good with uh, Maroon U. And another road show brought to you by our good friends at Alpha Paving. Thanks to uh, Brandon Leone and Justin Lanham for bringing us this awesome show. If you hear a little tiredness in our voice, we're tired. But... I don't want to say I feel good after a loss because I don't. In fact, I want to use the word that starts with a P. I'm ticked off that they lost because there was a chance right there. But I couldn't. Last year, I complained about the game plan. I complained about the way they came out and looked against Penn State. Yesterday, I thought the game plan was fantastic. Yes, it was. I thought everything should have gone AM's way. But they are who they are, and they're a team that doesn't hit a lot of shots, and they couldn't hit their free throws early on, and they could not stop the University of Houston OB. Yeah, oh, he's Olin Buchanan, by the way. I'm a trophy columnist. I am. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I think this game is uh, it's going to hurt forever uh, if you played in it, especially because you're you're going to walk away knowing that had you. Just made some more free throws. Yep. Made a couple of shots. They shot 38.7% from the field. They shot 64.4% from the free throw line. And yet that's because they got they kind of warmed up late. Yep. Uh they finished making 29, but you missed 16. And against, I think you missed 11 in the first half. Yeah, they they shot 11 of 22 in the first half. And at least one of those, maybe two, were the front ends of one and one where you hadn't, if you make it, you had more opportunities to score. And I'm saying now, AM did amazing things. They're down, they're down what? I want to say 12 points. And they go on, they closed the 17 5 run, was it? It was a 17 5 run in the last minute 49. And of course, it's capped off by that amazing. Inbounds play and three pointer by Anderson Garcia, just yep. amazing. Um, if they win, it's the biggest shot in in A and M basketball it is. history. Um, it would surpass AC Law. Yeah, because it's in the NCAA tournament. It's in the NCAA tournament going to the Sweet Sixteen. Yep, and you're knocking off a number one seed. I mean, all those things. So, um, but and, and all that was amazing, and and it was great credit to them. But they're going to feel like had we. Made our free throws yep. at a at a at a rate when A and M typically does. You know, there was a guy I can't remember the game right now, but it wasn't that long ago that they made eighteen, no, seventeen of twenty in the in the last like two minutes right. to, to 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 clinch a win. So this is a team that can shoot at the free throw line when they get hot, and they just weren't especially early. And they're going to feel like they 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 left opportunities out there. But that said, the way they they the diligence and just keep coming back and keep coming back and golly it's so disappointing that that they weren't able to close it out but you know what there's a reason Houston is considered the number one team in the country most of the year yep. and they just have guys that when the when the they're a great team when the game was hanging in the balance they made big shots well look you don't in in my opinion you don't beat a one seed missing 16 free throws and your star player being missing in action for 
ninety oh, percent of yes. the game. Yeah, you know, because um, he got hot ish at the end of the game. But let's be honest, like the the first half, he he was one point, and I'm talking about Wade Taylor, Wade Taylor. obviously. And I, I love the way he battled. I love the way he came back. That game was not conducive to his style of play because Houston is a very physical team. And in the first half, yes, a and got the calls. And if you look at my timeline from Houston fans, they you know they thought it was a, we'll talk about that in a minute. But Houston was very physical with Wade in the second half and in the first half as well. Uh, excuse me. He was very physical with him all game long. And that's not his kind of game. And then he was forcing in its shots. He was going early on. But to me, OB, it was apparent the game plan was find the weakest defender out there and post him up and go to the, the town. And that's what we saw from Boots. We saw from Manny early on. I know Manny struggled scoring at the end, but um, that was the game plan. Let's go downhill on them. And when their center got into foul trouble and was injured, you know, AM had a lot more success going to the rim. Well, it was a good game plan because, um, you know, you wish Wade, you know, look. He can't be perfect, and but last night he made five of twenty six, um, and and he's a much better shooter than that. Yep, and, and he has been especially. But A and M wanted to attack, and they did. Look, A and M did everything they needed to do to win this game. Yep, they shot more shots than Houston. A and M shot seventy five shots. Houston shot sixty six. A and M um, out rebounded them. AM had 26 offensive rebounds. 26. I think uh, they said it was a record for them this year, right? I, I think so. So you're doing the things. What does AM typically do to win? They, uh, they uh, make more free throws or the, they make more uh, shots. <laughs> yeah. They take more shots. They get more offensive rebounds and they get to the foul line. AM got to the foul line 45 times. They did their quote recipe. And you but, come back and say, well, they didn't play good defense. They haven't played good defense in a long time. In a long time. It's just, but they haven't they, played elite defense in a long time. But you have – you get, getting to the free throw line is great if you make them. Right. Well, how do they lose games? By missing shots. By miss, miss, missing shots, yeah. And, and by the way, they did take 23 threes, but that's, of course, with overtime and then at the end, desperation. Right. For, for most of the game, they weren't a big three-point shooting team. They weren't – they they hit actually at a higher clip than the University of Houston. It felt like to me Houston wouldn't miss an open three. Well, to your point, like A and M was in the first half was one of six right at the foul line. Um, and and by the way, that's why I love this game plan because look, we don't know anything, right? Let's be honest. Like we know things, but we're not in the we don't we're not at practice. We're not, we don't know these players the way that coaching staff does. But from watching this team early on, what did we ask for? Stop shooting all those threes. Yeah. And they did. I, I give them credit. Um, the, the, you know, there's games that you have to. You have to go with the flow of the game. It did not feel like this was going to be a 90-point uh, scoring game, 95 for a and 100 for Houston. But it became that there in the last few minutes. It did. Like you said, again, when you score 17 points in the last – Less than two minutes, you know, yeah. it's it's going to change the the tra- tra- trajectory. Um, but just so uh, impressed with with A and M, um, there are no moral victories, and it no, sucks no. to lose. But w- I have to tell you, when when Anderson Garcia makes that three, and you know, here's the thing: it was a great shot. It was a great inbounds pass. Right, uh, Boots had to had to. Uh, bounce pass it into him with one second left, and and uh, Anderson had the presence of mind to take a step back behind the line because there's only one second, so right. he's got and then and still just, get it off, <laughs> and it's just a perfect shot. And at that point, I thought they're going to pull this out, and you know what? They might have. You, you, there's a, like Buzz said after the game, a game like that, you always go back if this, if that. In the Houston took the first shot. Of right of overtime. overtime, and he missed a three, and the ball bounced toward the um, the, the to our left, to, yeah, to our to the shooter's left, right. right, almost out of bounds. And they saved and it. Houston saved it yeah. and got it back, and they hit a three. And A and M was playing catch kind up. of catch up from then. And who knows if if the ball goes out of bounds, if A and M can get over there and get the, you know, maybe it changes. Yeah. Hey. Um. I want to talk about delusionals. You know what delusionals are? Uh, people that live in Austin? Well, that's true. Okay. Fans. Oh, okay. Okay. And I mean this for every fan. All right. And including me and you. Okay. We are delusional. 
All right, explain. We see things all ninety percent of the time only through our eyes, like okay. which is the only way you can't see. But my timeline has got a lot of Houston people on it because of my time in H Town, right? Yeah. Um, covering the University of Houston, Kelvin. And it's amazing. People that I think are normal, smart people are idiots, right? And and by the way, we are too. When when, uh, when you're watching a, a when you're watching your sporting team, event, yeah. The amount of this game is rigged. Like people that I think are, I'm looking at you because I know you're watching us right now because that's what you do. You telling us that the game is rigged. That is, how can Houston go to the uh, A and M go to the line so much more? Because Houston was fouling more. Oh, it's it, it, to some of those like people that are like smart national broadcasters that, and I'm not talking about oh. Jim Nance. Robert Flores thinks it was the worst officiated game he's ever seen from MLB Network. He's huh. a Houston grad. Like, guys, were there some questionable calls? Absolutely. If you want me to point at one for you, how about the Jace Carter out of bounds play? That would have changed a lot of the momentum of the game. That would, I think it was at that point a six-point game. He's he, he's It's basically going to be a steal and a dunk. He missed a dunk, but that's because the whistle blew. That His foot did not go out of bounds. Have you seen the screenshot of it? I haven't, but no. I remember the shot. Man. Yeah, his foot is not out of bounds. Okay, mm-hmm. you want to talk about bad officiating? Oh, but the reason A&M and Houston were close in fouls because A&M was fouling a lot at the end. Sure they were. They weren't fouling 20 times at the end. Right. Look, well, I remember a play where a guy from Houston was uh, trying to drive, and he lost his uh, footing, and he sli- he's sliding with the ball. Yeah. And the official came over, and I don't even know what he called. And I remember Buzz came off the, the came on the field uh, on the court, and one of the players grabbed him and pulled him back. Right. You know, I guess. Uh, so so that really stands out to me. And there was another uh, play where I guess it was Manny, and they called him for a a charge on a. Oh, that was like, not a charge. And, and I'm like, well, wait, wait, I've. I've been watching basketball. I've not seen that call against yeah. the uh, against the uh, uh, offensive player all year because but, how everything's changed with the way they call it. I think that's my point. Of course, when your team is one fouling, you don't think it's a foul, and that's that's where like if it was us, I might think the same way. I guess it's my point about the delusionals. Yeah, but, um, but I try my best to take a step back, especially if it's two teams that I I know. I know I, I don't know this version of U of H, but I know Kelvin. Um, and I have a lot of respect for Kelvin, but he complains on every play. But the beauty about this game, Ob, and we, we're going to go around the room in a minute. But the beauty about this game to me was there was no guard who just was yapping. There was no guard who was crying, doing you know, you know his hand gestures like we saw in the Nebraska game. This was just two hardworking teams who had respect for each other, mm-hmm. um, and they just went and battled. And Houston is a one seat for a reason. They are awesome. They are very good. And I kind of hope for them to, to go on a run and win it all because a and went toe-to-toe. Uh, it felt at times that they were going to get too far behind, yet they clawed back. And if you want to see the officials help them, I'm going to say game plan helped them. Uh, yeah, look, th- there were times when I was surprised that a and didn't get the call. Yep. And I knew Robert when he was in Austin, and I liked him. but He's, oh, he, way, he's a nice guy, yeah, 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 yeah. But he's way off on that. His, I, uh, I, look, there were a lot of fouls called, sure. It was a physical game. Houston's physical. A&M is physical. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, his cougar was coming out in him. Yeah. One. But he's, a, he's a good dude. Um, but again, I think all fans do that. We see things through our lens and it's hard to take a step back and be like, well, actually the guy slapped him in the face. It should be a foul. Sorry. I, uh, feel like I'm able to watch objectively. Um, and, uh, I thought that, uh, it wasn't a well well officiated game, but on both ends. On both ends. And we just talked about some of the the calls that went against A and M or A and M didn't get that I just thought were head scratchers. And there are others I know that people uh, behind us who are all A and M fans react to and are like, eh, I think that was uh you know, I think that was probably the right call. Yeah. There was some drama behind us at one point during the game. Yes, there so. was. You know, somebody uh, always wants to keep other people from having a good time. There there's d- I don't even know if I want to get into it, but there was player families like enjoying the game and a fan was like asking them to sit down because, uh, you know, nine and 10 year olds were standing up on the and very flapping. first row. I'm like, oh, you can't see over. I'm- Come on, buddy. All right. Hey, uh, that's coffee talk presented by Texax coffee. Beat the hell out of mornings by going to texags.com slash coffee. And by the way, um, we're going to give away a free coffee. Uh, what what number should we make it for texting uh, 979-693-1150? What, well, let's see. You know what? 
I got an idea. How about we go with number 11? I know Absolutely. We, we usually do 12, but why would we go 11? Because of Anderson Garcia, a guy that just makes plays all year to help you win. And you know what? He made a huge play that could have helped him win. Yeah, so t- text in 979-693-1150. The I guess coffee. it's a good thing Manny didn't make that shot, though. Yeah, we. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Good. Well, well, well played, OB. Um, let's go around the room and say hi to the people out there. Um, we go behind the glass. We talk to a young man by the name of Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy, good morning, y'all. What's up? Oh, nothing much. Just, you know, sucks to see the the season end, like y'all said. Uh, but, I mean, going back to Anderson Garcia's shot, I feel like that's going to be something that, you know, every Aggie can look back on and be like, I remember where I was when Andy hit that shot and, I was, I was sitting on my couch watching it, and he, it went in. I was When he first got the ball, I was like, oh, well, I guess this is the best look we can get. And then he just absolutely drilled it, nothing but net. And I was like, no way. But, you know, again, sucks to see it come to an end. It would, it would have been awesome to see a, a sweet 16 run. But, uh, yeah, just I think that's what's going to stick with me more than anything this season is, hey, if you're going to go out, go out swinging. And that's what they did. Uh, they certainly did, man. Look, it was a fun game. It was at times it was a little aggravating. I mean, a lot of it because Wade wasn't going, was wasn't getting his, and uh, obviously the free throws were a problem. It was very much reminding me. I wish I wrote this, but you know, you know, last night we're going to rush because we don't want to be up all night. Yeah, but uh, oh, we were. It really was reminding me of Oklahoma City in two thousand. You said that a couple different times in the last minute before they were really they were in striking distance, but not you were saying it, and, and you know, and I'm. Because what I'd written, I needed to start, you know, just deleting yeah. again. And I, I, I don't know if you ever top Oklahoma City going, you know, score, scoring what twelve points in thirty two seconds. But they came you, close. But when you take into account that Northern Iowa's team just wasn't as good as you are, you're just not playing well, as opposed to playing a team that legitimately could win the national championship. A team expected to make the, the number final four. one defensive team in the country. Yep, yep, yep. No doubt. No doubt about that. Hey, um, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social let's Center. Do. I think, uh, is it Matthew Dawson working this morning? Matthew, good morning, buddy. Good morning, David. Uh, let me tell you, I just I get a texture right here. He said, morning, just checked. Our 86 points in regulation was the most points scored on Houston all season. And the most games they held their opponents under 50, that is true. Another nugget here, all right, to basically put into perspective the offensive level that we were, the level of offense that we've been playing at recently, if you look at games like past seasons where uh, in terms of scoring 90 points in four consecutive games, that has never been done before in A&M basketball's history. Granted, we were also playing against elite competition in the postseason in SEC play as well as the NCAA tournament. And you also, it's been done three times in a row, twice in the last 20 years, but that's it. So, and one of those was the 2015-2016 the team that came back against Northern Iowa. So the clip of this offense that they were playing at was, uh, in my opinion, pretty remarkable. But also, too, like, let's not forget about the other Aggie sports this weekend. We had some absolute... Oh, yeah, let's forget about it for a second. I want to comment on that. Oh, all right, sure. How the hell does that happen, OB? A team that we've complained about scoring... Multiple times this year, team that had a hard time putting the ball through the rim, yet they do it at the end of the season. And by the way, they still struggled. Like it's like look at this game. They missed. They should have had 102 points, not 95. You know, I would have taken. I would have been about 101. <laughs> yeah, if they gave halves, I'd, I'd be happy with 100 and a half. Yeah. All right, Obi's not going to comment anymore. Well, it's just you know in the. <laughs> In their previous five games, A and M looked like they figured something out. They were yep. bombing threes. You know, they were shooting over forty percent from three point range. Yep. And early in the season, they were one of the worst, uh, or most of the season, they were one of the most three point shooting teams in the country. And it seemed like that changed things. But um, Manny had a hard time finishing last night. A big part of that was because Houston's so athletic. Yeah. Um, Wade struggled. Yep. Uh, from the three point line and, and we're f- from the whole year, again, five of 26. Usually you give him 26 shots. He's usually going to make more than five. Um, and then the free throws. Right. So, yeah, you scored a lot of points and you had to to keep up with Houston, but, you know, still you, you left points out there. All right, let's do this. Dawson, I know you got more for us. You got baseball, you got softball, you've got plenty of stuff to get it, 
get into, excuse me, there at the News and Social Center. So we'll do this. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with some of those. We'll read some text messages. But right now we're talking about 12 under 12. The uh, It is a great place. It's the Young Alumni Spotlight. If you or someone you know graduated from A&M in the last 12 years, you're running out of time, guys. But you want to make sure that you invite your, we invite you to nominate yourself or someone you know for this 12 under 12 Young Alumni Spotlight. So every year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of AM's core values. That is excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Uh, previous year honoree, honorees have included leaders in business, higher education, architects, petroleum, engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close Sunday, March 31st, so be sure to submit a nomination soon. To learn more about this recognition and submit a nomination, visit TX. Dot ag slash 12 under 12 nominations again that is tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations So full disclosure, part of the last hour of the program today here on Texas Radio presented by David Gardner Schuler's Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour presented by the Warehouse of CC Creations. This roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. Um, part of the last hour, not all of it, part of it is recorded from late last night um, so we can get on the road. Justin Lanham has an early flight, so we recorded uh, about 30 minutes of the program about an hour, a couple hours after the game, obviously, because we did post game. So just uh, full disclosure about that. Look, we're tired. 
my voice sucks right now. Um, but it was fun. I was, I'm honored and blessed to have covered such a cool basketball game. Unfortunately, OB, it wasn't the way it didn't end the way we wanted it to. And that happens often. There's only, you know, one champion. And at some point the season comes to an end, only one team is the champ. I do want to read a couple of, um, messages that came on on texags.com and also go to Matthew Dawson here. Let me see if I find the one that I wanted to get to because it was good. Um, here it is. It is from Calvin Nuno. U of H to clearly the better team. Max played hard as usual, missing a ton of free throws, especially in the first half. That was critical. Good teams don't miss 16 free throws. Give U of H credit for Dion Wade. Shooting 4 of 19 doesn't help. Could have passed off to other players and he forced 30 bombs. They couldn't keep U of H below th- uh, 50% of the field. U of H almost gave the game away. All true. I think the uh, the difference in the game, yes, the free throws and Wade taking a while to get going, but credit to U of H for that. Not for the free throws, but for the defense on Wade. The difference in the game, A&M couldn't stop U of H. Well, that that's true. Um, you know, score 100 points. and But um, and like I said earlier, A&M has, hasn't played, you know, that, that, Suffocating defense, and where you keep the your opponent from scoring in a while. Um, I know what Kentucky was in the nineties, right? Yeah. Um, now I thought they did a good job against Nebraska. Yeah. But it's not like Nebraska was held to sixty or something like that. I can't. You know what? I can't even remember what that score was. Yeah. After a game like that, I can't remember a lot. But you know, it, it was a game where where uh, it seemed like UH. Every time they needed a big shot, they got it. Yep. Hey, before we go to Matthew, I know you're a huge soccer guy, so I'm going to give you a soccer update. Uh, the U.S. men soccer played against Mexico yesterday. No, I didn't watch it. I was watching the Aggies. But an Aggie was at that game, all right? His, uh, and I don't know him, but he's on Twitter. His name is Goat97. You see these pictures on my, uh, on my page. He got hit by a battery and was bleeding at the game pretty bad. It's on Twitter. It's all over the place. He's an Aggie. He was watching the game last night. He tweeted at me last night that he was, um, I believe, if not in the emergency room, on a wheelchair being bandaged up when Anderson Garcia hit the big three. So he was able to watch that and also celebrate the U.S. men beating Mexico again. I think they beat them three times in a row, I believe is what it is. But regardless, uh, if you see it on Twitter, it's it's kind of bloody. Takes more than a uh, battery to stop an Aggie, right? There you go. Just takes a free throw. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Matthew Dawson, softball, baseball, you pick. Where do you go? I'm going to start with women's golf. How about that? They finished runner-up at the Clemson Invitational. As a team, they shot six under. I was behind Vanderbilt's 12 under, but the third place, LSU got three under. So uh, kind of a definitely a separation there between A&M and Vanderbilt and the rest of the pack there. So fantastic job for our women's golf team. Softball. Softball, softball, softball. Eight and one in conference right now. They just swept number twenty-five Auburn for the third straight SEC series win of the year. And how about third straight ranked series win? Um, <clears throat> that that's going to leave them eight and one in conference. They have a great record. They're absolutely tearing the cover off the ball. Allie Enright is still hitting over four hundred, which is nuts. They're going to be playing LSU <clears throat> this upcoming week, which of course is going to be a tough task for them, but. Gosh, they're just playing so well right now, and their pitching is unreal, and they just got uh, uh, two players back from injury at the start of SEC play, which has been an absolute bump to their lineup. So, I mean, awesome, 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 awesome. Women swim and dive. Built Ford Tough. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> built, built Ford Tough. Women swim and dive team, they finished 14th overall at the NCAA championships, which included four Aggies winning All-American honors, which is incredible. And then women's tennis, to cap it off, beat Kentucky 6-1. And that's not even mentioning the baseball team, which I know we're going to be talking to Schloss later. Baseball team was fantastic. They won another series, or they won their series against Mississippi State, which is fantastic. So I'll end with this, though. This uh, give you guys a bit of a talking point here. Boots Radford, down the stretch. I don't think people understand how good he was down the stretch at the end of SEC play in the SEC tournament, NCAA tournament. He had, before going into the season, he had – Six double doubles in his entire career. In the last nine games, he had five. Yeah, didn't he have a double double at the half? He had a double. Yeah, he had oh. a double double. He had ten rebounds and like yeah. fifteen yeah. points. Crazy. He. Um, I'm gonna miss him. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about him in the next segment, plus where the Aggies go from here. Um, but yeah, no doubt about that. In fact, Cuervo Ag, I see your text question. How many of the starters could be potentially back on the team next season? Boots is done, but I think everyone is still eligible, right? Uh, 
We'll get into it. Wilden's Levesque, you said, is I, I think he's I had one more year. Well, maybe he does. You know, we'll we'll double-check that. Uh, Dawson, double-check the eligibility of some of those players when we come back. Uh, I, I do know that Boots is for sure gone. He yeah. might be the only one uh, of significant minutes leaving, but we'll, we'll double-check that. But we'll talk about that. We'll uh, certainly break down some more. I got some football things I'd like to get into, if not today, tomorrow with the OB. Uh, but right now, let's hit a break. We'll come back with uh, some more. And by the way, you can text us at 979-693-1150. We're talking, what is it? Wildens is a great transfer. So he's done. Wildens is done. Moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell online. CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. That's the uh, website to go and find your next car, right? By the way. We rented a car this weekend to come out here. It was fantastic. There's nothing like being in a new car that smell, the way it drives, the way you learn it. It is so awesome. And when you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet, you can test drive all the cars. I'd suggest you test drive the cars that you want to purchase as opposed to all the other ones. Uh, But I'm telling you, you're going to walk away with a great experience because um, great people, great value, great uh, pricing, you name it. They're going to take amazing care of you. And, of course, that customer service starts when you walk in or call in. And even after you leave, right, they're still taking great care of me here uh, a year and a half or almost two years since we bought our Chevy Tahoe out there. Wonderful place to go. That's why R.C. Slocum goes there, Dante Hall, you name it. Remember, it's about a 15-minute drive from the very edge of Bryan to the beginnings of Caldwell. Short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell, online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com.
Are you ever so tired, OB, that you can't go to sleep because you're so tired? I have been that way. Yes, I have. Last night, what time did, I, did we get back from the arena? Well, one third, one, yeah, one thirty. One thirty. Okay. And I woke up at six forty-five. I don't think I fell asleep till about two fifteen, two thirty, something like that. I'm not complaining. I'm just making a point that like I couldn't like I was amped up, but I wanted to sleep so bad. I was tired. I was amped. The lights, the the reaction, the the fun, the ups and downs. You this know? feels like one of our uh, football trips, like to Auburn, when we have to go uh, back to Atlanta and so uh, cross back into the Eastern Time Zone and lose an hour. I hate that trip. Yeah, so do I. I hate that trip. Hey, we're Texas Radio. Did you know that? I did. Did you? Did you yeah. know we're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers? I didn't know that. Did okay, good. Me? I'm glad that you know that. And you know we're in the Rollo Insurance Studio. I do. Okay, I'm just making sure you knew that. Yeah, good folks. And you know it's the go hour. The go hour. Presented by the warehouse. At CC Creations. That's right. And this road show. Yeah. There's no chance you know this one. What about the, the pavement? Brought, yeah. Uh, Alpha. Yeah. The Alpha pavement. Alpha, the Alpha dog. and the Omega of paving. The Alpha dog. Hey, uh, we go back to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Dawson, we think we've got the answers here, but uh, you want to kind of give us the uh, rundown of who has lost eligibility? The Wildens, Levesque, Boots, Radford, anybody else we're missing? Hayden Hefner, I think. Hayden Eli Hefner. Lawrence. Hayden Hefner, I believe, still has one more year of eligibility. Oh, he came he? in. He was in my class, so he was 2020 as a freshman. So he gets okay. that COVID year still. And yeah. I believe Henry Coleman is the same way. So the three folks mm-hmm. that were honored at senior night were Boots, Wildens, Levesque, and Eli Lawrence. So Because Eli Lawrence and Wildens, Levesque were both grad transfers, and I believe Boots is in his sixth year because he redshirted in 2018, and then he gets the COVID year as well. So Boots yeah. is in his sixth Doc, year. Dr. Radford. I want to uh, brag on Eli Lawrence for a moment. Not that he played and had significant impact on the game, but for a guy who came here as a grad transfer to play and didn't play, if you watch his demeanor mm-hmm. on the on the sidelines, on the bench, this guy was all in, man. He was he so was. proud of his he team. He, it, 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 look, we all get a little bit in our emotions sometimes when you know other people get opportunities we think we deserve, and I don't know if that's what he thinks. But my, the bottom line, he came here to play, he didn't play very much. Didn't play very much, but yeah, he was a uh, he was uh, he was about the team. Yeah, and uh, I, yeah, admire that. He was a if for no other reason, he was a really good acquisition or addition based on. I mean, here's a guy that shot thirty six percent from three point range yeah. for Middle Tennessee, and you can say, well, Middle Tennessee a couple of years ago, Middle Tennessee knocked uh, Michigan State out That's of the right. tournament. That's right. Um, and he came here and he didn't get, the, you know, didn't play as much because he wasn't, quite frankly, he just wasn't as good as other guys. But you know what? He, uh, he was a good teammate. He was a good teammate. And, uh, all right, let's, let's kind of go through what this team sh- could look like. Could right look here. like. So I think Boots moving on as bad as it, not bad. Congratulations, Boots. You graduated. You, you stayed an extra year. You did amazing things for this program. From a, personnel talent standpoint it sucks to lose a guy with his age because mm-hmm. i think being what 24 years old uh being a man with those you know in this in college basketball is an advantage losing him i think you don't it's not as tough as a blow because of manny's emergence because a month ago you'd be like man you got to find somebody to replace boots now you got to find somebody to replace manny's role as right. the third guy unless you find a guy who can replace boots as well but you, it's it softens the blow it, it it does to some degree, but you know we we can't overstate what boots meant the last three years, right? Um, and so replacing him, his production's not going to be easy. But you're right, Manny has shown the ability to uh, to do some great things. Uh, his emergence, if you would think, you would hope that he just continues to get better. Um, Jace Carter has been kind of. Hit and miss, yep. but played well of late. And if if what we've saw in the last few games is what he can be next year, you know that's, that's I like that kid. That, that's a great kid to yep. have. Um, and of course, Wade's you know should, could still be around. Now you got to keep all these guys together. Solomon Washington, uh, I think his emergence is as big a factor of the A and M success as anything. Yeah. So, but you got to keep these guys. And quite frankly, you know we got to address the quote rumors that are out there. And you know there's all kinds of rumors this time of year, but. Uh, it's been reported in other places. We don't know if the the, the veracity of it, but um, that Buzz Williams is being courted, uh, being pursued by Oklahoma State and SMU. Yep. 
Well, if that's the case, is he going to remain at, at Texas A&M? Let me, let me just say this out loud. A&M's a better situation right now than those places. Uh, I don't know. Well, SMU, there's a reason because they're looking for a coach. Right. <laughs> well, the, that's A. B, you have a chance to bring back the nucleus of a team that went toe-to-toe with a one seed who might end up winning it all. And quite frankly, if you didn't hit a swoon, and I mean, they played a tough schedule this year, yep. but if you didn't hit that five games, so if you, you're beat, not playing Houston, if you don't play right. If you beat Vanderbilt and Arkansas at home, if you win those two games, I think you're in the sweet 16. You, you're, you're probably still going to be playing next week. Yes. Cause you yeah. played a different opponent, but okay. Yeah. You got who you got and you almost beat UH. Um, so yes. Uh, you know, we're one day past the end of the season. And if you can look to everybody and keep this nucleus together, and that's a question now with yep. with NIL and I, I I you know we've it's been said on this program that somebody multiple teams are probably going to uh, try to contact guys on this roster and see if they can Look, lure them away. And I know that's not popular. I'm sh- you know like, but it's it's just the world we live in. Every team you could be winning. Like if you don't think like winning teams are going to lose players because of NIL in all sports, especially football, basketball, baseball. You're crazy. Yeah, and if you think people aren't going to tamper. They're doing it right now. Yeah, so tampering is a real thing, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Wade Taylor and and Solomon Washington and – you know, n- name some uh, Manny Obask. I wouldn't be surprised people if, call him if if they haven't been called already. But I will say this, and this is where I give Buzz his. I mean, I I, I give pro- Buzz his props. He builds a culture and a family atmosphere that I don't think his players are as susceptible. What was the word? Susceptible. Yeah, susceptible to uh, that. Now, I'm not saying it can't happen. Of course, it can. It's a, but I just think. The way they go about their family-like atmosphere, I think there, there's more of a bond and more of a brotherhood that you don't want to disappoint your guys in your locker yeah, room. I think the three guys I just mentioned are probably tied to Buzz. Yeah. Uh, more than some others. I mean, there's been guys that have left. Jackson Robinson, you know, he was here for a year, and now he's playing for – I've already forgot who he's played for. Uh, you know, Hassan Diara. You know, there's been guys that have left. But I think those three guys are uh, tied to Buzz. Um, and uh, the thing he warned about also with Wade, is he going to, is he going to pursue professional basketball? Right. Yeah. Um, so do we call this season a success and I'm going to take you through a journey. Okay. Before the season, had we said, I'll ask Billy this later on too. Had we said, you're going to make it to the second round of the NCAA tournament and lose to the university of Houston. Um, that's your snapshot. Is it a successful season or they made something out of something that could have gone south. Like, how do you? I think it is successful. Well, it's it, not as successful as I envisioned, but it is successful. If you got a B on your report card, do you consider that a success? Me personally, no. Okay. Well, I think they got a B on their report card. No, did they do great things? Absolutely. Um, but uh, well, hold on. let me answer that differently. I'm okay with a B. I'm, I'm using my kids as an okay. example. Okay. I'm okay with a B if that's the best you can be. If you should be an A student, then I expect an A. Well, again, AM started the season ranked in the top 15. 15. Um, they may very well be one of the top 15 teams, you know, but yeah. but you've got to take, you know, you got to avoid the, the, that five game uh, losing slump. Dream, yeah. And, you know, now I, I know I'm coming off of being overly critical. And I don't mean to be. I'm just saying that we, and, and I'm going to call it a success. They, they improved on last year. Last year they got into the tournament. This year they won a tournament game and damn near uh, beat UH, but almost doing it. I mean, it's 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 not good enough. So you right? almost won a modeling competition, but you didn't win. It's true. So um, it's uh, I, I give it a B. Yeah, uh, I, and a B is not bad. No, but, it's better. Was it better than last year? It was better than last year. If you look at what they did in SEC play, no. But the totality of the season, where you ended, better than last year. But so you have to take the to, the, the totality though and say, um, you know, they were nine and nine. Yep. Are they better? Are they better than that? 
Are they better than nine and than a team that goes? They should nine? have been better. They than should have been better than that. You didn't show up at home in the second half against LSU and you lost that game. You shouldn't have lost to Vanderbilt, uh, to Memphis. You shouldn't have lost to Memphis. You shouldn't have lost to Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. You shouldn't have lost to Arkansas twice. Twice, yeah. So eat and, and, and even South Carolina. You know, you lost two games at the buzzer and one at uh, with three seconds left. So again, we're not trying to be overly critical, but just saying. It was a successful season, but to what measure? If you went in needing to pass a, a, a test to to get a a job, or you know whatever. But hey, and, and by the way, let me just say this: I think we're allowed to have these opinions. The there's folks out there that didn't really support this team. I wish there was more Aggie fans at this game. I'm gonna be very honest with you. U of H. Had more fans than AM at this game. I thought AM did okay, right? It was better than the Nebraska game. Uh, but can we support this basketball program if, if, if we hold it to a certain level? I'm talking from, from a fan perspective, not a media perspective. If we expect to beat the University of Houston and we expect to be competing, then we need to support them at that level as well. Yeah, you know what? And, and maybe you would have seen that at, again. in Dallas. Now, well, yeah, I think you would have been Dallas, but. Had a And M, I'm going back to had a stronger run in the SEC, and you would have had more people. I just wish basketball was a bigger deal. I mean, Houston has a lot of fans that are been watching a team that's been national championship caliber for for the last couple of years. Yeah, that's that's a well, that's a great point. But I think baseball people are all in early, Mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'm not saying people aren't in. I just don't think basketball registers as much for our audience or our fan base. Basketball is the ultimate uh, bandwagon sport at a and Yep, yep. And, and maybe that way, I think we were talking to, I was talking to Billy yesterday. I think it's that way at a lot of Southern schools, right? Like, you know, before Tennessee was winning a bunch and before Alabama, by the way, what a run they're on. Um, they, those SEC arenas were not always jam-packed, right? So I, I understand success. But this team was a, if you like people, this is a, a, a people team. These are likable guys. They're good at what they do. They're hardworking. Um, if if we're going to complain, oh, we can't hit free, blah, 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 watch games. Like, no, just watch it once. Watch the games. I would go, hope. Go, go visit. I would hope that this is going to be a, a fulcrum for, for the future and A&M Reed Arena turning into a, an insane environment. Truffle shuffle. Come on, guys. This season was a success. How many SEC teams flopped in the first round? They finished the season strong. Yeah. We didn't say I, they I said, I said it was I'd give it a B. I don't find I don't find a B a failure. But I do think they were capable. Aren't there different ways of, to look at that too? A success, preseason success, would we have taken it? Yeah, we would have taken it. Did we think it would be better than that? We said from the very beginning of the year, this is a team that could be in this make it to you know, the second weekend. Maybe even B plus when you consider that they were that they took UH into overtime. Yep. But the fact is, over the totality of the season, had you taken care of some games that you absolutely should have won, you're not playing a one seed in the second round. Right. Right. Let's do this. Let's hit a break. We'll come back with around Aggieland. Our K Nagley will be here uh, to not here in Memphis, but to, at, at the uh, Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's hit a break here right now. If you're tired of living with chronic joint pain or knee pain or shoulder pain or pain in your hips and your back, and I know you've had pains everywhere, OB, you got to make sure you reach out to the good people there at QC Kinetics. Uh, you don't have to go through another year in pain. Going through pain sucks. You don't want to do anything. You're stuck in your room. You're just like, I don't want to do it. It hurts. Let QC Kinetics take care of you because they have pain management and they are the nation's leader in regenerative medicine. And that regenerative medicine is incredible, guys. They're going to take amazing care of you. It's all natural process that uses highly concentrated healing properties from your own body, putting them directly into your achy joints to restore that repair, that damaged joint tissue. We're talking about lasting pain relief, the kind of pain relief that you get to go outside and do what you love to do with no drugs, no surgery, no downtime. There's a reason that pro athletes for years have been leaving the country to go get this done. It's here, and it's now in the Brazos Valley. They have over 100 clinics in America, and they're here with regenerative solutions and get you moving once again pain-free. So if you're sick of living with pain, you need to make sure you reach out to the good people there at QC Kinetics. You can walk. You can run. You can climb stairs. You can play golf. You can move. No pain, no pills, no risk of surgery. 
at all. The phone number is 979-452-6000. QC Kinetics, 979-452-6000. That number again is 979-452-6000. I like that. It's your jam. Well, they're, he's, we he's talking about made boots. Yeah. Hey, it's Tex-Tex Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. This roadshow brought to you by our good friends at Alpha Paving. Brandon Leone, thank you so much. Justin Lanham, great work this week. All right, let's go back to the actual studio there in uh, College Station for around Aguiland, presented by Norman G. State Bank. Norman G. State Bank, rock solid Banking website, normalgstatebank.com. K Nagley. Nuno, I got to know. I know you're an emotional Aggie fan. So, yep. reaction to Anderson Garcia? Thought like, were you calm? Were you like, was there some yep. emotion that okay. was released? Ha- have you seen those reaction videos of UFC fights yes. when Joe Rogan and <laughs> uh, Anik, John Anik, are like responding? Like, OB and I were like, oh, <laughs> it was like, it was like, um, you remember when he's saying, that's got a chance. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, if you've ever watched Russell Simmons' Deaf Comedy Jam, I know you haven't, Kay, because you weren't born. Like, the, <laughs> like, it felt like that kind of environment. People behind it, we were right by all the Aggie families, right? Like yeah. the players and coaches' families. It was like, oh, and I'm on the media, I'm on the row. Like, <laughs> I think everybody that was up and down the media road, you know, that had a woman from the Associated Press sitting next to me. Yep. And she, re- everybody reacted. Yep. Because that wasn't, obviously, if you were an Aggie, it yep. meant more, but just 
such a tremendous yeah. game and such a tremendous comeback and that shot with one second. They had a they, they, if you love basketball, mm -hmm. that play just resonates with you. By the way, two other things, Kay, on that point, and I'm sorry to cut into your around Aggieland, but uh, Jam Jam Jamal Shedd talked to us a couple different times, or one time in particular, that like he was complaining about a play, and he was like looking at us, and I was like, is he talking to us? Like, <laughs> uh, And then also, OB almost caught a ball that went out of bounds. Almost. You like put your hand, like it was good for him. Like the first game, I got hit in the head with a basketball. That's right, I do remember that. This time that. I almost was able to catch one. Okay, uh, why don't you get at least one thing in and then we're gonna save some of it for the end of the show, which I know we have to time correctly. Perfect, let's do that. So we've talked plenty of men's basketball, but let's quickly speak on the women. Aisha Koulibaly had a 26 point outburst and it was almost enough um, for the Aggies to come back, but Nebraska did ho hold on late on Friday night as Texas and women's basketball was eliminated from the first round in the NCAA tournament, 61 to 59. Another close game there, uh, ending Joni Taylor's second season in Aggieland. All right, uh, okay, we'll get back to you here at the end of the program. Ob, I think you offered to get me a Cuban sandwich. Oh, buy one. Yes. We're going to be driving. We're going to try to leave here by 10:30 um, after we pack up, and uh, we'll give you the last half hour of the show with Justin Lanham. All right, that's going to do it for the uh, go hour. We'll see you here in a few on Tech Tag Radio with Coach Loss.
All right, welcome back to Tech Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. And uh, if this is for the ladies out there, but hubbies or potential hubbies, I should say, um, if your lady's looking for a, well, this is for her. Let me just read it the way it's written. If you've been looking for a way to drop a hint, uh, they have the perfect way for you there at uh, David Gardner's Jewelers. Uh, tag your significant other in comments and DM to make an appointment for a chance to win a $2,000 credit towards your dream engagement ring. How to enter, both follow David Gardner's Jewelers, tag your significant other other in comments, DM to set up an appointment between now and Saturday, March 30th, like and save this post, and uh, share and post to your story and tag them for more. Giveaways end Saturday, March 30th at 6 o'clock. Winner will be privately notified. Uh, we are here in our Rollo Insurance Studio uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. We're about to head out of here momentarily uh this road show brought to you by alpha paving let's talk some aggie baseball because it was a fun weekend uh, as they take the series against mississippi state we go back to the studio ryan broninger is uh standing by there at the rollo insurance studio with coach jim schlossnagel Bronny. thank you david i appreciate that good morning coach good morning thanks for coming in um we talked in the lobby a little bit about just i thought your team showed some toughness this weekend bouncing back from a road Series loss to Florida, that's, you know, there's no sin in that. But there were some bounce back performances, and, and really you guys fought some frustration offensively and were able to find your way through it and win your home series and, and hold serve. Just your overall thoughts on your takeaways from, from last weekend. Well, I think you got to combine Wednesday night too, you know. Play, have to play that game on Wednesday night against Prairie View and, and win, the, win the game in the manner in which we won it. Uh, and then the, uh, what Thursday night, Got a great starting pitching performance. That was a great statement for Prager uh, for his response to how he pitched at Florida uh, and also just his career in the, in the SEC, you know, to, to kind of establish himself against a really good team. Uh, the middle game Friday, uh, super frustrating, super frustrating for everybody in our dugout. Um, and, you know, obviously we're playing a great club, but we felt like we swung the bat really well. And that's one of the, you know, Augie, uh, Coach Garrido used to say the two things you fight in baseball the most are frustration and boredom. And uh, that was a really frustrating night because when you're scalding balls all over the field and whether it be into a shift or into the wind, um, and then you, you know, we just, they got, we, we hit a guy on a, on a two-strike pitch. Uh, Mershon hits a ball that if Caden, you know, is a step to his left is actually a four six three double play ball and now – Hines is hitting with nobody on, um, and uh, and Sadeo just right there felt like uh, you know I'm getting too deep into it, but you know that one of our questions that we go into every weekend is when do you use Ashenbeck, right? You mm -hmm. want to use him twice to win, um, not three times, but twice to win. And so I didn't feel, I wanted to give Shane a chance to pitch. Uh, I wanted to save Ashenbeck. That was only the fifth inning, I believe. Um, Shane threw a really good breaking ball to start the at-bat that ended up out of the zone, and then we tried to go back to it, and it was a bad one, and Hines made us pay. And the one spot on the field where the ball would go out, Hines hit it. Um, so anyway, and then, and then to come – so that, that you're exactly right. That we, didn't, we don't meet after games very often. I didn't meet with them after the game. I think everybody knew what that game was. It was a frustrating, dang it, baseball got us bad today, as did Mississippi State. And then on Saturday, Justin Lampkin, man. Uh, you know, he had really poor fastball command most of the season, especially at Florida. Uh, and then yesterday he had everything working for him. And, and um, Braden Montgomery is did Braden, Montgomery, <laughs> did Braden Montgomery things, and we put together a lot of great at-bats. Our crowd was amazing. Uh, so, yeah, that's a, that's a typical SEC weekend. And, and, boy, when you win them on Saturday, days like yesterday sure do – they're they're really amazing. You sit back and watch everybody else. Yeah, through just, a game. And, yeah. You either sit back. I watched a little bit of college baseball, mowed my grass for two and a half hours, uh, and I know our coaches enjoyed some time away. Hopefully, our players enjoyed some time away, and then got to watch the Aggies last night. Um, so we're ready to get back at it. Uh, throughout the course of that weekend, and because Friday was so frustrating, how pleased were you with the offense to bounce back entirely? Because I thought I was like, man. You were just really frustrated on in game two, and then game three. Here comes Saint Joe up to ninety eight with real ride and real life. That could have like compounded the issue, but I thought they bounced back really nicely. We did, and in the first two or three innings, we had more of the same. I mean, we yeah. smoked a ton of balls. Um, uh, several guys hit balls right at people, and like, holy cow, how long is this going to last? 
And then Jace hits his ball to right field, and the guy's about to catch it, and it clicks off his glove. And then Braden, you know, mm-hmm. uh, he had already hit his solo homer, but we, it was still a ball game, right? And, but and, but when, when Braden turned on 96 miles an hour in on his hands after seeing two off-speed pitches and hit that homer, um, I think we all felt like we had a game, not the game in hand, but all right, we have the upper hand. Now can, can Justin continue to do what he's doing? And then we have Evan sitting down there ready to finish it out. What were the conversations like in the dugout as Justin's going through those hitters, maybe the sixth and the seventh? Uh, and and you could tell from my vantage point that okay, they're Mississippi State's getting a little bit closer. They mm-hmm. rocket a couple foul balls. Their swings look more connected. Uh, but you guys just kind of kept riding Justin until you couldn't anymore. And by the way, you mentioned the crowd when he walked off the mound. That yeah. was as loud as I'd heard Bluebell Park for a pitcher, and it, it was well deserved. Yeah, r- really well deserved. And I'm kicking myself. I should have told him, hey, make sure you tip your cap. Yeah. Uh, but Justin's not like that. I'll leave that. <laughs> I, you know, I'll, I'll leave that up to him. But. Um, I remember going out and taking the ball from him, and Grohovic looked at me. He's like, "Holy, this is awesome!" <laughs> you know, so a guy, guy like Gavin, who you know, we've been in some cool places, and we'll be continue to be in cool places, and Bluebell will continue to be packed. But that was a great thing. Um, but yeah, the, the, in terms of Lampkin, uh, felt like I mean, Max came to me, and he'll say, "Hey, hey, that last fastball, the last inning is like, like only as only eighty eight." I said, "Okay, all right, let's just see how he does." But then in that whatever inning that was, the sixth maybe. Or yeah, sixth. I took him out in the seventh. Took him out in the eighth. Took him out in the eighth. Took him out in the eighth. Lead off so, single. So I, yeah. I, he caught his. He caught a little second wind, uh, or third wind, and um, I was like, all right. And so I said, let's just send him back out. Let's see if he can. Let's, we'll go batter by batter. Uh, he gave up a leadoff hit, but he then punched out the next guy, uh, and then the three-two pitch to the last hitter he faced had been a strike on yeah. most of the day, uh, and I think there's something to. Uh, even in today's world where there aren't many complete games or starting pitchers, the average start in our league's four and two-thirds innings, I think there's something to, or not I think, I know there's something to feeding the ego of a pitcher and giving him an opportunity to finish an inning and not have to come out of the game in the middle and, and stretching him out to where, hey, man, you know, we look at what Prager's start, even Jones going into the sixth and then – Lampkin, look look at what that did for our bullpen usage and our bullpen availability for Tuesday night, uh, uh, tomorrow night, and then uh, we have a sh- another short week. So uh, just him sucking up even those innings that, uh, or those outs on a Sunday helps us as we're trying to build things and stack wins on top of wins for the rest of this week. Richard and I were up there watching the game and going, okay, like how I was going, what would you do out of the bullpen now? Because you got to the point of the game where – you know, I'm sure going in, you're like, oh, we got a fresh Chris Cortez down there yep. who is dynamite. 100%. And you got Brock Peary that can help finish an inning. But once it got to the seventh, I was like, this is – and you got a lead? There was only one guy coming out of the bullpen. Yeah, there's only one. And, and, you know, I've really studied – I am not. I mean, I have did a lot of the same things at, at TCU, but I've, I've really studied how the most successful programs, consistently successful programs in this league have done it. And to me, no disrespect to all the others – Florida and Arkansas, um, you watched how Coach O'Sullivan used Neely and, and, and Nolan having so much long-term time in this league, successful time, and it's basically when you have a chance to win, mm-hmm. you, it's so hard to win, it's so easy to lose. You, within reason, you fire the bullets you need to fire. And I wasn't screwing with the game on Thursday night when we had a chance to finish it with Evan, and then I went into it saying, okay, let's have Chris ready. Let's have Morton, who we I think has taken a step. Let's have those guys ready. But, dude, once it got to where we only needed 25 or 30 pitches to finish the inning, yeah. there's no chance. I mean, and that's not a statement on Chris or, or Isaac. That's a statement on the greatness of Evan. Mm-hmm. And there, there's no way I could let someone else set the table, you know, load the bases with one out, and then ask Evan to get at, on a day the ball will go out of the ballpark. Um so you, you go with your best guy and you win that series and we'll worry about it later. Well, game one I thought was really big in the series because you were playing on back-to-back nights uh, and it was an SEC series coming off an SEC series loss. And like you said in one of your post games, the goal's 15. Well, you just want to get to 15. Well, that means you got to win at home and you don't get swept on the road. So you start Thursday night and Gavin Grahovic, I mean, just kind of puts his stamp on, on the game in inning one and then had the one of the bigger swings on the weekend with that grand slam it just seems like 
And then my favorite at bat, and I told Gavin this, my favorite at bat he's had all year was him punching that ball through the right side yeah. in game three to add some insurance. Just his continued growth as he starts to figure out this is the way they're trying to get me out. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'll, I'll tell you this also, a little behind the scenes, Mike and he did a lot of work before the game yesterday um, to prepare for that pitcher, for that specific pitcher, because we knew um, that there would be a moment uh, that where he would that that guy would be coming in the game, mm -hmm. and I actually think I think I said this to you that at bat, well, when he hit his grand slam on Thursday, that guy was getting loose in the pen. And when I pinch hit Targoch and Stevens, the lefty, struck him out on three pitches, I think their coach, and I don't want to speak for him, but in my mind, I think their coach went, ah, he's got it. Mm -hmm. He can get this guy. And, and I, they're probably kicking themselves for not bringing that right-hander, right-hander, right Shulky, right, right, hand, right in, at, in that moment. And so I think Gavin was prepared. He was going to change his approach. He was going to widen out a little bit stay in his legs, just try to stay on the ball. And they're playing shifts on Grohovic, and Grohovic hits the ball over the field. And so um, I don't want Gavin trying to hit ground balls to second base, right. but I want him to have the ability to hit the ball over there if that's what the situation calls for. And that just shows you what a great player he is because it's not just the homers, it's winning situational baseball. Mm -hmm. And that's what the great ones are able to do. Well, take me back to that decision to pinch hit Targosh, then you give him the start in game three. As you just kind of continue to mix and match yeah. and try to find an answer at second base, a long-term answer at second base. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't be a fan. Like, I mean, I, got, I know what's in, it, we know what's inside the heart of these guys. We know what Ryan's capable of. Um, his right-handed swing we were feeling really good about. And we're just trying to cherry-pick times to where, all right, this is a good matchup for him. And he's swinging it great in BP. He's working really hard to make adjustments. Uh, all right, this is a moment. This is a moment where, man, if he runs into one, now his confidence might be season changing might be season changing, career changing, right? And so uh, we picked that moment. That guy threw three awesome breaking balls, um, and then felt like, okay, the matchup with um, the switch pitcher that started yesterday throws 70% fastballs. Ryan's a good fastball hitter. He smoked a ball up the middle into the shift. Um, he had a two couple. Two of them. Two of them, yeah. yeah. Like, so he had, the quality of his at-bats were great. So I look more at the quality of bat, the at-bat, the quality of the contact. It, is it cool if a guy flares a ball in? Awesome. But we just know that's not sustainable, right? So what is sustainable over time? Um, that's what we're looking at while you're also trying to win the games. Mm -hmm. You know, you put defense into account. Ryan made some nice plays on defense. We had him in a little bit of a shift, and he hustled on that ball to his left and made a nice play at first base. And then we know, I mean, Caden Kent's a good player. He's still an amateur. He's still a developing player. There are way better days ahead for Caden Kent. I truly believe that. Um, but it's just a matter of trying to figure out what in the moment gives us the best chance to win while also trying to build our team mm -hmm. to, to be the very best version of itself as we keep moving forward. And I think... What fits in that answer right there is Caden Sorrell and mm -hmm. how you've kind of just kind of steadily brought him along and then really pays off for you in game three. Yeah, really proud of him because his at bat ended up being, you know, the switch pitcher. I don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name. Saint Ja. Saint Ja. He went lefty against him, right? Mm -hmm. And the home run he hit was a left on left breaking ball. Mm -hmm. And then he stayed, his next at bat or that last at bat, he flared, he get that ball hit down the left field line and then. You know the ball he caught to to start off the game, that that what, can change the game. What did, you know what it reminded me of? Jordan Thompson catching the ball against Florida in the SEC tournament against Mike when Micah Dallas started, mm -hmm. and it's like okay, that everybody went. Ugh. Yeah, settles him in, yeah. settles settles the pitcher in. Yeah, uh, and then when you're just searching for every out towards the end of a game, the catch he made at the bullpen. So, so you're probably going to see more of Sorrell um, because. You know, he does have an, a lot of elite skill level, and he plays with a pretty slow heart rate, mm -hmm. which is the biggest challenge for a freshman. And that's what makes Gavin Gavin. That's what made Jace Jace. And we have some really young, uh, we have some really good freshman players on our team that are, are they're going to be that good too. But it's just a matter of how can they, there's a saying, you know, that guy's a great warrior when there's no enemy. Right, you got to be a great warrior when there's an enemy, mm -hmm. and not just in the sim games. Right, you got to be able to go in there, show that relaxed heartbeat, 
stay under control on offense, defense, the bases, and and show me positive body language. And we have some players on our team that are really, really talented, and they're going to be great players. Uh, I wish I had done this. Maybe I know we'll talk again on Thursday, but I, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go look at the first two or three weeks of the SEC now and see how many true freshmen are making impact. And remember last year, you and I talked over the course of the season last year, there was only 20 freshmen that got 50 or more at bats. And and Texas A&M led the league. We had four of them. And so um, it's, it's just hard. It's just hard to be that guy. Hopefully the player understands and hopefully the parents understand. Well, look at Wyatt Sanford. I mean, not Wyatt Sanford. Um, <laughs> Wyatt Langford. Yeah. Um, how cool is that? He's in the big leagues. Yeah. And he had four at bats as a freshman. Four. Yeah. Four. So moms, dads, players, just chill out, man. Your son's <laughs> going to be a good player if you allow him to be a good player. Yeah, and there's there's a some natural up and down that has to happen for them to get there. And last thing, I want to talk about Jace for a little bit because Javin Homer's twice, Braden Homer's twice on the weekend. But Jace, on that middle game on Friday, he goes 111, 108, 104 for outs. Yep. And then he able to respond the next day, which goes back to what you said about just – being able to get over that, and that just takes time, and you've, you've got to go through it. But has two huge doubles to, to get you guys going yesterday, or yep. excuse me, on, on Saturday. And I, I know that you were probably a little frustrated when he gets picked on the inside move, yep. um, but you're never going to take that aggression away from Jace. No, we can't take it away from him. And um, I know fans are frustrated. I was frustrated. And, of course, every time somebody gets picked off to, to end an inning, the guy who was hitting comes up the next inning and one million percent gets a hit, <laughs> right? So it even feels looks and, and looks worse. But, you know, there's a difference between playing aggressively and recklessly. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think that was a reckless play. Um, you, you, you see we're stealing less bases this year, obviously because whether it be the personnel or maybe we are, hey, I, I do want to give this guy a chance to hit. But honestly – it's the, the, the scouting report on Texas A&M is they are going to be look, looking to run, so they're going to be looking to get outs, make us make out on the basis, so we have to be more cognizant of that a little yeah. bit. So uh, we may have to make some adjustments, but I'm not going to take that out of Jace. Jace is a 2020 player, 2020 player in, in the major leagues. We just got to pick and choose our times. Last thing before we let you get out of here, uh, just tomorrow night against Houston Christian, you decided on a starting pitcher, and yep. will, you get, as you, will you ask guys that have been playing, like, Hey, do you need a day? Uh, if they're banged I, up or they yeah, just... Yeah, they'll... Our trainer, you know, they talk to her. Mm -hmm. She's great. She'll give me an idea. But, I mean, they had two days. They just had a day yesterday. Right. We, have, they have, we won't do much in practice today. Uh, Luke Jackson's going to start for us. I want to see Luke start. Um, we, can, we need to continue to build. Uh, I had a meeting with that, the kind of that group of pitchers that's on the tail end of the travel squad and the guys who don't travel. And we had a meeting the other day, and I talked to him about the value of every game. You want to help this team win? Go look at Evan Oshin back in the face and go look at Sadeo and go look at the guys that are pitching a lot and say, and say, hey, man, you guys put your slides on and sit down. We got this for, for this game. And then you take care of that Tuesday night game. And then you, when you do, then you put pressure on me to put you on the travel squad. Mm -hmm. So we do need to get Cortez an inning probably. I'd like to get Shane back out there get a little bit better taste in his mouth. Um, but as we know, we've proven we can be down and close to or potentially lose or lose to any team we play. And the Tuesday night games are about to crank up. Oh, yeah. You know, next Tuesday we have to go to San Marcos. Air uh, we, Force coming in. Air Force, who's a nightmare to play. Houston. UTSA. Is, UTSA. UTSA just won a series. They're uh, on the road at East Carolina. And so – uh, they aren't always going to be SWAC teams, you know, and, that, and that's what I said to those. You, know, you guys are going to get to pitch against some of the very best teams that will play, so you better be ready. Coach, appreciate your time, man. Yep, thanks, Bronny. All right, that's a and head coach Jim Schlossnagel here on Tex Ags Radio. I think I'm coming back with David Nuno on the other side of the break. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, friends, welcome back into Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. And this roadshow is presented by Alpha Paving. I, I do, and Bronnie, I think you're in studio still, correct? Okay. What was about to happen? I'm going to read this text message because I think I ruffled some feathers earlier, and I'm glad I did. It's supposed to hurt. Um, I made a comment earlier um, that I, you know, I'd love for us to to have more of an emphasis when I say us fans to care about basketball a little bit more. I, I really do. I, I feel that way. Um, and Glenn and Brian says, if you're looking to support basketball, look behind you. You're in Memphis with a backdrop consisting of images of a football helmet to a uh, Kyle Field. Physician, heal thyself. So a couple things about that. Well, number I'm one, you're you not. Number one, you're not a physician. So I'll fact check him there. Oh, well, you're there, Billy. Welcome, hey, buddy. David. This is why I'm confused because I'm not sure. If there's a basketball in front of me. Billy's here. You're talking about the backdrop in Kyle Field. I thought I was talking baseball. So, leader, lead us, Doctor Do- Nuno. Doctor Nuno. Doctor Nuno is going to say this, Bronny. I had you. If, if you looked at the rundown, I had you as a TBD, depending on Billy's availability. Uh, but I love <laughs> you, so you can be part of this discussion. So, just. To bring it all together, I made comment. I, I wish more Aggie fans came to this game, Billy. Um, yeah. And then Glenn's text message there is trying to, I guess, call us out. I cover basketball with the same veracity that I cover football. When Garrett Chadwell comes in the studio, he gets all my support and attention. I've covered every sport the exact same way because, to me, that is the biggest story, and that is my role in this chair. Um, I'll let you all take it from there, Billy. Well, I think. That it's seems just, nitpicky just, to yeah, me. Yeah, it's so like disingenuous and nitpicky. Yes, because we've just pushed football down your throat, not only on Texas Ag's radio, but because it's the biggest sport at Texas A and M, as it is anywhere in the South, anywhere in the South. The only places it's bi- it's not as big in the South are places like Baylor and U of H that Duke just haven't Kentucky. been good at football. I mean, in the deep, like in, yeah, Duke South, whatever. Yeah. I mean. SEC land is what I'm talking about in Texas. But here's the thing. It's the same way at Oklahoma State. I got news for you. I remember going into gallagher and that place was loud and packed, and now you can hear a pin drop in there. And that's been the case for like a decade. Anywhere, when you're not good at basketball for a long time, and by not good, I just mean you're not making tournaments, you're not relevant, you're not making runs in March or within your conference. The crowds go down. Alabama, Tennessee, Auburn, oh, it's great to go into those places and watch games. Guess what? It's great to come into Reed Arena when A&M's good. I can point to a few games this year where it's terrific. Kentucky, Tennessee, last season, every home game. It, it's about building a culture. It is not easy to do. Um, I remember going into Rupp Arena years ago with Billy Clyde Gillespie's team and AC Law, and they they had a chance to be a Final Four team and a national title contender, or so we all thought, and there weren't that many more people than were there last night. And it was 90% Louisville red in that game because they had the short drive, and it happens. U of H and Baylor – Baylor's won a national title. They've been to three or four Elite Eights. Houston, uh, they're coming off like, this is like their third Sweet 16 in five years with an Elite Eight worked into that. Or, or I think it's, yeah, I think it's four Sweet 16s in five years with an Elite Eight worked in there as well. It, they didn't, they, it's not like they were overwhelming and drowning out A&M fans by any stretch. They had a little more. It wasn't like this massive, uh, red wave in there so and I get it, it's U of H versus A&M but look at Baylor national title they weren't flocking into that place and guess what would have happened Friday if A&M would have won it had been packed in Dallas packed in Dallas and we would have been talking about what an amazing turnout it was but you know why because I've seen it happen I saw it in San Antonio the game after that aforementioned Louisville game so it's just part of the country you, you, you've got to win to get them there, and then you've got to win to sustain it. And you certainly have to develop a culture to travel. It's what you sign up for anywhere in this footprint and really most places in college basketball. And I think once it gets established a little bit more, Billy, 
And this, the way the AM fan base has always been, it's been football won by a million miles. Yep. And baseball's probably always been second. There have been times where basketball has surpassed yep. baseball, especially yep. when Billy Clyde was here. Uh, but, like, what a winning culture can do to a fan base is like, you, we've seen what Schloss has done to the yep. AM baseball fan base, completely reignited it to where these home games are fantastic atmospheres. I think Buzz has done it in the last couple of years with AM basketball. But what I was going to say was. You, I travel out, out to Palo Alto last year for that Stanford yeah. Regional, and it's mostly Aggies in that place. Now, very different home crowd, but the a fan base traveled out there. So I just think that the winning breeds the culture and, and, and generates the interest. And maybe next year now, if a goes back to the tournament, there's more people on board. Let me say this. First of all, that's not really – I say this as Nuno's about to drive back. That's not really drivable like people want to say, just because oh. it's un- <laughs> just because it's under ten hours. Like you got to think about college kids. You got to think about you know people whose job it is not to cover the basketball team, but fans. That's not really a drivable like in the middle of a week on a Friday. You know, you can get up on a Thursday you have to take and go. Thursday off. Yeah, it's Friday not off. It, you know, and, and Monday off like. They're up there doing the show. That would essentially have been – well, they went Wednesday, but that would essentially have been the travel. You miss two work days if, if A&M and U of H are playing on Sunday and Baylor and Clemson. Um, but look, to the guy complaining about how we've uh, propagandized A&M basketball fans out of attending road games within, uh, through our hard, cultivated work to do so um, – I don't. I think Aggies traveling is an overrated myth of something that happened a long time ago. I mean, sure, if the Aggie baseball team goes to Omaha, we're gonna have a great crowd. Is it gonna be like some of those other programs that are used to going every year? No, you'll get used to it. You get used to it, and like like LSU and you know whoever else goes Arkansas, Arkansas, they go year. It's like it'll. You'll get used to it if A and M starts going to Omaha. So. But this myth that Aggies travel, like bowl games, oh, my God, A&M's going to – not really. I mean, yeah, they're going to fill up a Texas Bowl. That's why they always want them. They're going to go fill up a Cotton Bowl. But that's a myth from, like, 20 years ago when, when the Bulls knew A&M fans would travel. It's just – it's too – I'm not saying you shouldn't. I think you should if you can afford it and if your job allows it. And I, I am – sensitive to the cost of bringing a wife and kids and all that. But the reality is it's too convenient not to go now. So it does take kind of conditioning and winning. And I, and I do think more fans should have been there this week. I do, because this is a team that, you know, it's a second straight year in the tournament. It's the third straight year in a row. I think they deserved to go to the tournament. I would have liked to have seen more fans there. But I was also going, they're not going to be overwhelmed and run out. Um, Nebraska was an interesting anomaly because they did kick your ass, meaning our fan base. They shamed A&M in that regard, but they also have had nothing outside of volleyball, which has been tremendous. They haven't had a lot to cheer about. That's a football school. That's a football school. Bronny, you know they haven't been what they once were in baseball for a while. They haven't, you know, they've had nothing in basketball forever. That was well documented. And they thought this was their shot. They thought this was going to be an epic weekend in Memphis. And Texas A&M got in the way. But I, I, I think, again, had A&M won, we would have seen the fans turn out. And, and that's how you really grow it. And you have the fans turn out. You go beat Duke. And, and it's tough. It's a tough ask. It's a tough call. So, but, I, yeah. I do still think there should have been more than there were. Last thing, David, I know you're up against a break, but I pulled up the site this morning before I came into work, and the front page of the premium board is full. Like, there's not one topic yeah. on the board that's not about basketball. Yep. That This team, I think, really did a really good job of captivating, captivating the fan base, and if they're able to bring back some of those names, Wade, Andy, if all those guys come back, then I think you'll enter the season next year with a lot more juice behind the program. Hey, guys, I appreciate you, Bronny. Thanks for doing the interview with Schloss. It was yep. a great weekend for baseball, softball, you name it. We'll come back with with much more. Right now, Milliken Reserve time. 
Farm to Table community in College Station. Homes, trails, farms, and wide open spaces. And their mission is to build a healthy community around nature. And you know that because I've been talking about Millican Reserve forever. It's just a great place to go connect with nature and with each other. They're dedicated to a conservation of a healthy community. I like health. You should like health too. You should like walking. It's really fun. It is. It's not overrated. It's actually underrated. Go check out the uh, awesome trails out there, the wooded landscape, the uh, walking path, the equestrian path, you name it. Creeks, ponds, and gathering areas. They're committed to maintaining and restoring that natural habitat. Go hang out with the white-tailed deer. They're nice. Songbirds, the rabbits, the turtles, you name it. Generation after generation, you're going to come back to that same pristine countryside place because they want to share in a legacy of conservation. When you go there, you should consider hiking, biking, canoeing, kayaking, equestrian trails. They've got the evening yoga, they got the summer camps, they got the music festivals, and the farmer market tours. And of course, the beautiful neighborhoods out there like the creek, the hollow, the meadows. Check it all out at millicumreserve.com. Again, that website, millicumreserve.com. And we are back here on what I call Tech Sags Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. This roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. Thank you to Brandon Leone and Justin Lanham for sending us out here to give you uh, the coverage out here 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, these these guys are a fun group to be around um, when they're focused or super focused. When they're having fun, they have a great old time. Yesterday's game did not go the way we all wanted and planned, but it's going to be an, one that we're going to remember for a long time. We go back to the mothership where Billy Lucci is there. And, and Billy, you came up to us at overtime, man, and uh, you felt good. You felt, I, mean, I think we all did because, obviously, yeah. Andy shot, we're going to remember forever. Uh, yeah. what, a, what a cool moment to be a part of. Unfortunately, they just didn't finish it. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be a bittersweet one in, in A&M history. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it won't be at the top of my list of, like, the the low to the high to the lo- like the roller coaster of emotions. I mean, obviously that comeback against Northern Iowa was incredible. Uh, the first time A and M advanced to the Sweet Sixteen with that win I talked about over Louisville, where they missed a, a three pointer, I think maybe even to win it, certainly to tie it. Um, and then you have there's a lot of buzzer beaters or. You know, you think about last year's win over number one, bam. I mean, there's a lot of those, but I'd say this one might be number two behind the Northern Iowa. Um, but I, is it weird to say that just fr- from the fan experience and how I almost want to put it you can't put it at number one because they lost the game and you walked away feeling, you know, so dejected and like you, you know, your, your soul was just ripped out. But it, the fact that it was Houston and a one seed and they were so good. And the fact that it felt over there for the last several minutes felt like they were just, they, they withstood A&M's last rally, their last best punch. They pushed that lead up to a pretty insurmountable point and then to come back and then to tie it the way they did and have it be a guy like Andy that's so beloved by the fans and just the most, I mean, probably the most unlikely guy on the court to hit that shot. I'm trying to think of who else was out there, but we know he can hit threes sometimes, but still probably the most unlikely guy on the court to hit it and he just buries it and that celebration was almost like a victory. I mean, you look at U of H, they look like they lost the game. You know, it was an incredible March Madness moment, and I'm not just saying that as an Aggie. Like, people around the country were buzzing about it last night. And then to come back in overtime and you lost. And I thought, there's a million plays in that game, Nuno, and I want to address the the officiating later. I think both teams have gripes, so it's not going to be like A&M got robbed type thing. But I thought a, a just the worst possible way to start that overtime, and it was such a almost – and I know you got to snatch up every rebound, and they did, they did such a great job on the glass, but it was such a bad bounce. They played – Terrific defense on that first possession of OT. And it takes a, a wild, long rebound. Their guy hustles, makes a great play to get it. And then they hit a wide open three off of that. And it was like A&M had climbed a mountain to get there and finally tie that game with no time left on the clock at the buzzer to get all the way back. And you play great defense on that first possession. And they get the ball, and they get a wide open look, and the same, same character, twenty one, buries it, and uh, all of a sudden you're back down three. And then was it the very next possession? I think did A and M go down and turn it over? They had a bad possession. Yep. And the very next one, again, great defense, and, and I thought Wade played great defense on Shed there, and, and for the amount of contact that they allowed in that game. And I know there were like 75 free throw shot. A&M had like 45. It, that, if you're going to call that game that way, in no world was that a foul. That was really good defense at the end of a shot clock. He threw his body deliberately into the guy to get a foul, and the ref fell for it. All of a sudden, they're down five, just a few seconds into overtime, and they're right back into the same thing. 
of having to dig out, chip away, claw away at it, and and they couldn't do it. And I just thought those first few seconds, really that first possession, then A&M gets the ball, they get to go down and try to take the first lead in forever. And I think with the foul trouble and then 21 fouled out right after that, I think they really could have put U of H in a hole, and they couldn't quite. And it was just, again, it was a luck of the bounce, and it was what I thought was a call that absolutely shouldn't have been made. But I also think, look, for the Cougar fans, I, I, I went back and read everything. I was watching the game. I heard them. Look, if I ever saw A&M get called for that many fouls, I'd be doing the same thing. We all would. Yep. It, it, even the, you know, the most astute basketball mind among us that can see, Logan, who officiates, who would go, no, that's a foul. No, that's foul. You would still be like, man, this is insane. I thought it was the game plan. I thought it was a, a, a strong game plan. And had A&M made free throws, it would have looked like a brilliant game plan. There were times when I would like to see them pass the ball more because it didn't seem to be working. But for the U of H fans complaining, the officials spent one quarter of that basketball game not calling a damn thing on the Cougars. And I would contend that almost every time A&M drove to the basket, there was a, a pretty obvious foul, body contact, hand checks, like, crazy i like physical basketball i like watching teams get after it like u of h like a and m does I, it's great but i thought for any fan complaining on the other side i would say they spent 25 percent of that game swallowing their whistle completely to try to even out the fouls i think u of h was whistled for 13 or 15 first half fouls they had one foul for the first like eight and a half minutes of the second half. And all A&M did was drive to the basket, drive to the basket. Nothing was, I mean, like literally one foul was called in nine minutes. So you went 15 and 20 minutes and one in nine minutes. That was a deliberate effort by the officials to start to even things out. And that's pretty normal in college basketball, but you can't go one foul with that amount of contact when A&M has the basketball, you just, you can't, you know, in good fit, in good conscience do that. So I think both sides can certainly complain, but to the Cougar fans that were like, well, that was no, like they, they foul, they play hard as hell and they foul. It reminds me of when I watch, you know, Billy Gillespie with Joe Jones and AK and Pompey and they foul you, they beat you up. And and A and M knew that going in. I thought they handled it really well. And and the one true frustration about the whole thing, it's just it just sucks. It's sickening is the free throws. I mean, because everyone in that locker room knows they'd have won that game with free throws. I mean, with seventy percent. If they would have made a normal amount of free throws in the first half, like including some misses because they missed what 11 or 12 in the first half 11 and that doesn't count at i know there was at least one front end of a one one there might have been two so you left off 12 or 13 points in the first half and you're down five like just throughout the game in that first half had they made a normal amount they're kind of playing with a lead through the whole first half u of h would it wasn't going to be a big lead but it would have been houston expending that energy to try to keep A&M from going to six, seven, eight point lead. It would have been A&M playing with that, you know, possession and a four point lead and Cougars going, can't fall down by six here. This is instead it was kind of the other way around. And, and it was a hundred percent due to their inability to make shots at the line. And it was everybody in early. I mean, they, they, they got better at it in the second half. But it was everybody early except maybe Andy. Uh, maybe Henry hit three out of four, but like everybody was chipping in to, to the missed free throw parade. And it sucks because that was something that was a huge problem early in the year. And during this stretch, I thought they've done – in fact, they had done so much better at it that I really didn't – it wasn't something I was worried about going into this game. They did it in, in the same gym – uh, the game before they shot, you know, like I didn't think that was going to be an issue, but it reared its ugly head. And man, what a, it, it's like the worst thing that you could look at 
when you lose a game like that to where you have to look at it and go, we can only blame ourselves. That That's the hardest part, I think, for athletes, a team, or anything, just to say, we can only blame ourselves here. And that, that stinks because the effort was there. I'm, I, I don't think any Aggie – yeah, there's no way you couldn't be anything but proud of this team and respect the fight. Like, that's A&M fight right there. That's A&M fight. They, they represented on the national stage so well. Houston's a great team. They gave U of H everything they could handle, not once but twice. And you, you credit Houston. For, I mean, again, they got hit with a what for most teams would have been a knockout blow. They took a standing eight count. Shed's incredible. The culture that Samson's built there over the years is, is incredible. The toughness. Uh, there are a few teams that can match A&M's toughness. Houston is one of them. The Aggies have played Iowa State. They played Kentucky, Tennessee. Alabama's in the Sweet 16. Uh, FAU is a final <clears throat> four team <clears throat> last year. That's the toughest team A&M's played, and they played them twice, and they played them to the wire twice. Um, but the way they, <clears throat> the Aggies played last night, to me, like embodies everything you want an A&M athletics team to be about. That's what we want to see. And if you see that, you can't complain about anything. You can lament missed free throws. You can wish that Wade Taylor had his normal game, and, and I think it's just – and he battled his ass off. It's so tough to see him not have the game we know he can have. And I know Houston played a big part of that with their defense, but even if he'd had to sit out there and hit shots, normally Wade knows he would do that. So you can lament those things. But Wade Taylor at times this year, a lot of times put this team on his back and carried them there. Um, and last night the team picked up the slack, as they have many times this year as well, and they almost brought it home. So you can lament that, man, if, if we could have just had this or if we could have made these shots from the, from the charity stripe. But what you can't do is take away from the effort, the heart, um, just the clutch playmaking down the stretch to get back into it. Nuno, that was almost – I mean, it was. They forced overtime. That was as – that was damn near – if you factor in the opponent, that was damn near as miraculous as the comeback against Northern Iowa. Not quite, but it was, it was close. as rare a comeback as you're going to see in college basketball. When a one seed's up 12 with a minute 50 left or whatever it was, and there's a buzzer beater to force overtime. I mean, you just don't see that very often in this sport. And it's the sport where you kind of see everything and you see everything all the time in this tournament. But a, a one seed blowing a 12-point lead in a minute 50 and a three-point buzzer beater by one of your bigs, man, that's, that's incredible stuff. And uh, we're always going to wish A&M finished it off and wonder what if. That's the beauty of college basketball. It's the beauty of college sports. Right. Let's hit a break here, Billy. We're going to have a super short segment coming back, so maybe we'll get an update from the News and Social Center. We'll hit a break. We'll come back. You're listening to Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, this roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. We have a really short segment here, about a minute and a half. So, Billy, why don't we go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center, because Matthew Dawson can Let's update go. us on uh, some of the other sports and maybe a text message. Absolutely. Aggie Track and Field actually had a meet today or meet this weekend on Saturday. They did fantastic. Let me run down the list of first place finishes. Men's 4x100, women's 4x400, men and women's 100 meter hurdles, men and, men and women's 400 meter hurdles, men and women's 100 meters, men's javelin, men and women's pole vault, women's high jump, men and women's shot put, men and women's discus. And those are just first place finishes. Just first place finishes. So they did a fantastic job this weekend, I thought. <coughs> But yeah, um, one of the text messengers, Wendy, she said, no one's really talking about that pass to Andy for the shot. Do you remember even who passed that uh, ball to Anderson Garcia on that shot, David? Remind me. I, I don't know. I thought, That's why I was asking you. I don't even remember. I just remember the shot. So I, uh, it was a little bit slow pass, but definitely got that was pretty sure it was boots on the seconds. inbound. It was boots on the inbound? Was, yeah. All right. Well, they, thank you, boots. <laughs> boots and, and Anderson Garcia. Aggie legend. Aggie legend, Aggie legend. Right there. That's awesome. Awesome. All right, we got to hit a break. We'll come back with uh, more with Billy Lucci next on Texas Radio.
And we are back here. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. This uh, roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. Brandon Leone, Justin Lanham uh, making it possible for us to come out here. Justin did great work. We'll have him for the last half hour of the program or so, but we're going to continue on with Billy Lucci. So, Billy, easy question, right? Um, successful season or not, in your opinion? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, could it have been more? Sure. I mean, every school but about a couple will say that this year. But, um, yeah, successful season. Hell, I think even if you would have said beforehand, a hey, second round of tournament, get that tournament win. I mean, it's not like something you go throw a parade for, but it's something that needed to happen. It was a next step. Do I think this team could have accomplished more? Sure, yeah, I do. Um, I know I've, I've read a lot of people saying, well, if you didn't have that losing streak, you would have been a higher seed. You would have been at least a sweet 16. I don't disagree with that. And that losing streak was a – and also, you know, getting – Thumped at home by LSU and then losing to Arkansas early, coming off that Kentucky win, like losing to Vandy, coming off the Tennessee win. Like these are things that really cost you in terms of seeding. But I, you just don't know how things would have gone. It's hard, I, Yeah, I think they would have gone further had they not run into a team like Houston or UConn in that second round, Purdue. The way they were playing, and Kelvin Sampson said as much, like that's a team that can go to a Final Four. And he said after the game, everybody said they were a lot better. You know, I forget his exact quote, but he's basically saying, yeah, they were – not only were they better, they were a lot better. There weren't a lot of teams playing as well as A&M. And they, are, they were a dangerous team. I think, you know, who knows what would happen with Duke or potentially a Marquette. Or an NC State, like I think there was a real, there was Final Four potential with this group, with the way they were playing. If you just think that Wade Taylor goes home to Dallas and look, they were not going to see defense anything close to what they saw last night in Dallas. Duke's really good. Duke's better basketball team this year than A and M was. Same with Marquette. So let's not just act like they were going to roll through. That was a two and a three seed it's probably sitting there for them. But we know Texas A&M could have won either or both of those games. They were good enough to do it right now at this point in the season. They weren't good enough all season. It took a while. A lot of our preseason projections involve a team that had Julius Marble on it in the paint. Right. All six, nine of him and, and, and that low post scoring and that – that toughness and that willing, willingness to grapple and, and, and fight, and that would have added a whole nother rebounding presence and depth. And, man, who knows? Who knows? So do I think it was successful? Yeah, I, I think it was. Uh, and also, you know, college basketball is what we need to do. Do I want them to be better than 9-9? Nine and nine in con Of course. Um, but college basketball, it's about, getting in, playing your best ball. It's a, it's a weird sport in that it's about getting in, playing your best at that time of year. Obviously, you'd love to go wire to wire. I, I do want to see, like, if all things stay the same and the guys come back that could come back, I, I would love to see this team go wire to wire next year. As, you know, there's going to be ebbs and flows, but avoid that bad losing streak. Go a whole year without losing to a Vandy or Wofford. It's not easy to do. You know, I mean, it's not easy. A lot of teams have those, those warts and, and do some nice things in March, but avoid that really bad one like they've had each of the last two years and avoid the, the, the five games, eight game losing streak that, that have gotten them two of the last three years. But at the same time, they were playing their best basketball at the end of the year. They had some memorable wins this season. They dealt with a lot in the way of injuries. And, and we, I mentioned the suspension. Um, there's beauty in the way they bounce back from that losing streak. 
And to go and win and, and lose a buzzer beater to South Carolina that really, it basically said, if you don't win out at least into that second game of, of the SEC tournament and maybe the third, you're not participating in March Madness. And this season will be considered a complete disappointment. So they were literally backed up to the, the final edge with no margin for error. And they just put their heads down and they took the court for, you know, they took the court for Georgia and then Mississippi State. And then they went to Oxford and, and, and looked against the Mississippi schools that always are the bane of A&M's existence, it feels like. They went in there and, and they handled business and then some against both those teams. Then they went and beat Ole Miss again in, in kind of the ultimate pressure game because they might have not gone had they lost that one. And then they went into Rupp. I said Rupp. It wasn't Rupp, but it felt like it. 99% Kentucky fans, and they knocked out Kentucky. Great game against Florida to fall just short. And then come back, and, and that Nebraska game was one of the best tournament performances I've seen from a Texas A&M basketball team. It was master class. It was awesome, fun to watch. Again, you were completely outnumbered. Fan base, like that was a road game, insane volume every time Nebraska made a bucket or got a stop, and they just blew the doors off of them. And then we, we've talked about this U of H game. I mean, that was, I thought the A&M UCLA one, you know, was the 8-9 the that I'll always remember. This was a much better, much uh, more memorable game there. Uh, so I think it's going to be tough when you think about this team because yeah, had they handled business and, and, and just kind of gone the normal curve during that losing streak and, and not lost that one to Vandy and not lost twice to Arkansas or whatever, I think they could have been, let's just say normal. You know, maybe they're a six seed. You know, maybe they're a five. But that doesn't – you don't know the matchups. That doesn't guarantee that they're getting passed around two. There are better teams than than – that A and M team had a five or a six seed that didn't get out of this first week. And look at Baylor. You know, look at Baylor losing to a six and you know, it's none of it's guaranteed ever. But yeah, I think they could have helped themselves in seeding. But at the end of the day, I do call this season a success. And I think it's uh hopefully a stepping stone moving forward. Hopefully it's a stepping stone moving forward. And and hopefully they can, you know, avoid the the low lows there's always going to be lows almost every team deals with that but hopefully they can avoid the lower lows and jump right back into like legitimate sec contention next year and i think they can if you you look up and guys like wade and andy and and that nucleus of guys on this team are back where you you kind of just lose in terms of like key 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 performers uh, boots, which is going to be incredibly difficult role to fill. He was incredible last night, by the yep. way, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. I mean, and, he, and Billy, I, I do want to spend some time here, kind of reflecting on his time at A and M, because um, look, if you are able to hit on the portal like you did that year, heading into actually the first couple years, um, you know, twenty one, twenty two, you know, when you get boots, you get Henry. Um, you hit on Dexter Dennis, and and look, I like Jace Carter a lot. Hopefully, he, his his career is is a good one here at Texas A and M. But if you can hit he got this off season, better, by the way, yeah, know, with the emergence someone, of uh, Manny Obasiki, I think you you are on to something big next year. Yeah, I mean, Wade, Manny, Andy, Solo, Henry, and I, by the way, he had a quiet contribution these last couple games where Henry kind of you know, came out of whatever was, you know, whatever had been holding him back. I thought he was, you know, he really helped out with his minutes. But, yeah, if you bring back that nucleus, and you do have to go in the portal, <clears throat> and I do think that, he, you know, he has to add more in the way of contribution than they were able to do this year. And like you said, more like the, la the two years prior to that, uh, this could be a really good basketball team next year, like a <laughs> one of those ones that, does what this one almost did or, or two years ago my you know what we thought you know coming within a game of the sec title a&m could be a, a 
an exceptionally strong team. There's a lot that has to happen. And look, I'll address the the you know the rumors everywhere. It's, it, everyone's talking about Oklahoma State and Buzz, and I I think that part there's a little bit of low hanging fruit there. And and I read all the stuff on the message boards, and I know about you know, all those little private chats off you know the the stray off Tex Ags chatter, and there's enough there that I understand why people go, oh, you know, because I think it's been at times a frustrating run for Buzz here just to get it going and roadblocks. And when he got here, it was right during an AD change. So there's enough to give you – there's enough meat on that bone to make you either whether you're worried about it or you're not or whatever, and that's part of it too. I, you know, some people say, well, I don't know if Buzz feels appreciated here. That's been every basketball coach that's been here. You know, like, and I think it will be hard, contrary to what people think, to hire Buzz away from a and mm-hmm. I think between the contract, between what he's got coming back, between what he's built, his family being here now five years, I know he's been a mover if you look at his career. And, and Billy Clyde was the same way. A lot of coaches are movers. And they kind of go, okay, I don't know how else to say this. We're like, okay, I wore out my, I think I've worn out my welcome and I've got an opportunity. I'm going to jump to it and go and reset the clock. I, I'm, try, I'm trying to think if there's a football coach that's done that. You know, Sumlin probably wishes he had done that and gone to USC. Jimbo kind of did that leaving Florida State. He might have wished in hindsight now that he would have done that with LSU. Coaches sometimes do that, and they do it more so in basketball. But just off a gut feeling, I don't think Buzz does that. I think Oklahoma State hires someone else. I think those rumors are just something that you kind of hear it, and you go, yeah, I I, I can kind of see that, and here's why. And we all do that. I I engage in those speculative conversations all the time in what I do. I get the hand-wringing. But I think we're going to look up and Buzz and the staff are going to be attacking the portal and understand they got a couple pieces to go and hopefully the right people step up uh, and, and strengthen this NIL here for basketball, which I think has been solid, could be better, and hopefully they make it better to where they can go out and get the right pieces and maybe an impact guy or two. And I, I'd love to see you know everything sorted out with whatever's going on with Julius Marble where he's back too. And then think about that. Think about that basketball team. So rather than worry about the what if, which we'll obviously follow over the next couple of weeks or days or whatever, rather than worry about that, look at, damn, man, if you want to speculate about something, picture a team with this nucleus coming back plus Julius. And, David, I know there's questions about the offense always, it seems like, and, and Buzz certainly – gets prickly on that topic and defend, but man, you got to look at the offense and, and obviously again, like you said, replacing boots is going to be so damn hard. It always is that way though. I think if they'd have been able to have Dexter Dennis this year, yep. this team might be like, might've been like a three seed in the tournament and, and a favorite to go to a final four. Like if you'd have had that stop, imagine, him defending, you know, because I thought Solo did a great job on Shed for large parts of that game. Imagine Dexter Dennis doing it. Right, you're right. And, and then with that free – like, man, that's a difference. He was a difference maker for this team. But anyway, Boots is too. But you look at that nucleus, and if you were able to throw in marble and a couple of – like maybe another starting addition in the portal that a proven real guy, and maybe another key contributor out of the portal. And that's I'm 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 at I'm at two guys here, and that doesn't who's to say they can't get. I'm at two, with that nucleus. Man, that's an exciting basketball team next year for him. And you talk about the offense, and the reason I went off on that tangent is Boots was such a big part of that. But man, Manny and Wade. Solo's game continues to evolve. But how, 
this stretch right here, and I know, you know, like last night, it was felt like it was just, hey, drive to the basket, get fouled. That Nebraska, drive to the basket, get fouled. No one's complaining about that. They scored 98 against Nebraska. I know it was overtime, but they were well into the 90s against U of H. They were in the eight, in, well into the 80s at the end of regulation. Kentucky, they went for almost 100. Florida, they went for 92. Ole Miss, that first half in Oxford was as beautiful as you're going to see in terms of shooting and scoring and running and getting up and down. They were up 25-plus against a really tough defensive uh, Mississippi State team. So for the last – and against South Carolina, who's a damn good team, they, for the last eight games or so, this team offensively night and day different than it was uh, for most of the season. So hopefully – Whatever they were doing there <clears throat> isn't completely dependent on Boots, and I know it wasn't, but hopefully <clears throat> they can replace what Boots brought to it as much and kind of recapture that because that offense, you know, and it wasn't a two, three-game stretch. I'm saying it was like an eight, eight-game stretch at least there where they're scoring, I mean, damn, man, go look at what they, they were putting up 90-plus several games in a row there down the stretch so they figured something out offensively there if that can carry over this could be a damn good team next year so instead of worrying about what could happen i would say maybe today since we're all bummed out now be excited about what might happen billy thank you sir um right, we'll talk to you here in a couple of days all right buddy thank you billy lucci there um, we'll have more basketball throughout the hour. Justin Lanham uh, to our recorded session that we did last night. We'll get into that next. Right now, we're talking Costa Vida. Yeah, I'm going to say it with the accent because I love Costa Vida. The Fresh Mexican Grill has a concession stand. You know where Olsen Field. They were at Reed Arena during the uh, basketball season for both men and women. Uh, and now you can find them at Olsen Field down the third baseline. And they've got a great uh, menu out there. Chili, lime chicken, sweet pork burritos. They've got the sweet pork bajo bowls. They've got the chips. They've got the queso. they got the key lime pie. And when it gets cold, and maybe we'll still have some cold times out there, the Mexican hot chocolate. And if you go inside the store, you'll want to ask about the home run combo. And that is a, a favorite of Jason Lavalette and, of course, Ryan Targach, who is our 12th man there for the baseball team. The home run, or the number 12, I should say. The uh, home run combo is an entree with sweet pork enchilada smothered in house-made queso with rice and beans. And you get a large drink and all of that for just eleven ninety nine. You got to go to South College Station for that. It is such a great place to go. You'll love it out there. They've got uh, such great food and 15% student discount with a valid student ID that cannot be combined with any other offers. So make sure when you go to uh, the third baseline at the concession stand or you go to South College Station and you see Holly, give her a high five and say, Texas sent you by. She's the best. She's a great Aggie out there. Aggie owned and operated 4501. Mills Park Circle in College Station. Again, that is 4501 Mills Park Circle in South College Station. It is Costa Vida.
All right, welcome back to TechSags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. We are continuing our conversation about A&M last night, taking on the University of Houston round two of the NCAA uh, tournament. And this is Roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. They're an award-winning paving contractor servicing Texas, ready to deliver excellent uh, customer service, meticulous project management, and, of course, quality workmanship for all of your asphalt and concrete needs. Their projects include retail, office, multifamily, industrial, and notable clients such as the Dallas Cowboys, H-E-B, Grace Star. Visit them at alphapaving.com and let them work for you. He's Justin Lanham. I'm David Nuno. And uh, we're recording this after the game so we can get up on, on the road quicker. So if it looks a little bit different, our uniforms or our clothing from uh, last night, Justin, let's go to yesterday's game because, to me, look, the free throws are going to be an easy thing to point at. This is more than free throws. I think there, there were several pockets in this game where offensively A&M was certainly challenged. They had like a five-minute stretch, a three-and-a-half-minute stretch, yet it didn't matter. They, the, the beauty of a Buzz Williams coach team is that they're going to keep swinging, and sometimes they're going to hit shots and force overtime, and a team's going to be with a lot of foul trouble, and you're going to have a chance. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, that's why we still had a chance, you know, late, late in the game and, uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately came out on the, on the losing end. But uh, you've got to give them props. I mean, they just kept fighting and kept fighting. I think, uh, you know, we, we talked about how this was going to be the thrill in Memphis, and it was. It felt like a heavyweight bout. Uh, just, just two teams throwing punches all night, um, and uh, again, props to A and L for just continuing to battle. Um, it's hard whenever you see a deficit like that late in a game, and mm -hmm. you kind of feel like time's not on your side, momentum's not on your side. But they continued to fight and, and gave themselves a chance, and that's all you can ask for. So I thought at half, A and M's actually in a pretty good spot because they're down, I think, five at the time. Wade Taylor had one point. He was not, you know, part of that offense at all. They had missed so many free throws, 11 of 22 at that point. Um, I thought they were in a good spot, but they didn't start the second half in a good spot. No, they didn't. Uh, but, but you're exactly right. You feel uh, at halftime, you got to definitely be going in there as a coach thinking, hey, things are going to turn around in our favor. Uh, Wade is probably going to get going. Again, I think as a coach, you're always thinking of kind of like the law of averages, like you are who you are, you know who Wade is, you know that he's eventually going to get going. Um, and so you're feeling positive going into, into halftime, uh, even though you're struggling from the free throw line, Wade's not really getting his, um, they were getting to the basket a lot, I felt like, but the, the positive for me too, is you kind of had already gotten them into foul trouble. Um, I think multiple three or four guys already had two fouls at halftime for them. And so I think that that's huge as well. So um, I, I think they had a – I really do, uh, David, think that they had a really good game plan. Um, you could tell that they had this mindset of, hey, we're going to attack the basket yeah. and uh, we're going to try to get them in foul trouble. Um, and they did. And um, I actually – a buddy texted me while the game was going on, and I texted him back, and I said, uh, you know, expect, uh, expect for the refs to kind of ease off a little bit on calling some fouls in the second half. And, look, I'm not saying anything about the officials. I'm just saying I think they had called so many in the first half, I didn't think we were going to get as many in the second half. They were going to allow a little bit more contact in the second half. And I, I think they did some of those finishes at the rim and things like that. So, uh, But, again, I think in the first half I thought – we had a pretty decent game plan, and things were probably going to – if you're a coach, you're thinking the thing things are going to go better in the second half. I thought the game plan was whoever the third or fourth best defender out there for Houston. They have a lot of good ones. That's who they were going to go after. And it seemed to be, even though he scored 30 points, Sharp, it seemed like in the first part of the game, they are like, all right, Sharp is on boots. We're going to attack, 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 put them in foul trouble. And it was it was brilliant, except they couldn't deliver – from the charity stripe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, Sharp does foul out there um, at the end of the game. Um, I thought too, like Cryer, I thought Cryer was a guy that you can attack. Uh, he's a great offensive player. I think out of all those guys, I think he does just enough uh, to still be on a, on a Kelvin Sampson coach team defensively. I'm not saying he's a bad defender, but I think his, his offensive production is more than what his defensive production is. Um, and so I thought, you know, um, we could have we could have attacked him a little bit more as well, um, but definitely sharp. Sharp's interesting uh, because he has a little bit more length. I feel like, and yeah. so he can contest a little bit at the rim. But I definitely think that he was a guy that uh, they were trying to attack for sure. There's a uh, at the end in overtime, Buzz calls a timeout as Boots is attacking the rim. Um, 
a lot of social media uproar over yeah. that. Yeah. From a coach's perspective, what are you seeing? What do you think Buzz saw? Yeah, here's what I don't love about that, just being honest. I I don't love it because now you got to get the ball inbounds against a very good defensive team. Sometimes that is really hard to do. Um, and what, what Houston's going to make you do is they're going to make you throw it over the top of them. Um, you're not getting it in near the basket. You're probably not getting it into the corners. You're going to have to throw the ball over the top. And sometimes that's tricky. Sometimes that leads into a turnover. And so I don't love that. It's it's a tough one. It's, it's, it's the kind of the million-dollar question. Do you allow – the play to play out and hope that you can catch them off balance or do you call the timeout and set up a great baseline out of bounds? Um, but unfortunately, against a really good defensive team, I don't love having to throw the ball in again because to me that's that's potential for a turnover right. um, and, and you a five-second call, whatever it could be. So um, I don't love it. I kind of wish that kind of would have played out a little bit more, but um, that was the call that was made. All right, from my time in Houston, I've spent all my life in Houston, and, I, and professionally, a big part of my career in Houston, I have a lot of people in my timeline that are Houston people, right? And I saw a lot of the officiating being terrible from their perspective. Um, the, the foul calls, I forget what the number was. I can look it up here in a moment. But the foul, I felt the officiating was actually in A&M's favor in the first half yep. and not in A&M's favor for most of the second half. Um, and I also think part of A&M's game plan was we're going to not necessarily get U of H to foul us, but we're going to attack and see if we're either stronger than you yeah. or the strongest defense in America, they're going to be over physical and they're going to foul us. And that's yeah. what I felt the game played out like. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's kind of what I mentioned earlier of the first half. I think we were attacking, attacking, attacking. Officials uh, were calling some fouls on them, um, and that's probably where you get some Houston people in your yeah. mentions saying that they felt like it was unfair. But I felt like in the second half, I felt like they backed off a little bit. But they were more upset in the second half, though, which was oh, a, that's, that especially right? in the last five, in the last three minutes of the game. Okay, um, they, they certainly. But look, and I know that a, but Houston had twenty eight fouls to A and M's twenty four. I do understand that at the end of regulation. A&M was fouling quite a bit, right? Sure. That's part of it. But I don't – and at the end of overtime, they were having sure. fouls as well. So I, I understand that – Making up some fouls. But I didn't – I really – and maybe I have A&M goggles. I didn't think it was one-sided. I thought in the first half they were the right calls, but sometimes those calls weren't made. And in the second half, those calls weren't being made as much as Wade attacked the basket. Yeah, absolutely. And that's honestly what scared me about these guys a little bit. I think the – the, that they had the right game plan and the mindset of, hey, we're going to attack the basket. I think that's the right mindset. I was a little uh, uh, kind of uneasy in that thinking because I don't think this year we've done well when we attack teams that have a little bit of length at the mm -hmm. rim and, and that are super athletic. Um, you know, you're having to throw up an acrobatic shot. You know, you're not as able to get as close to the rim. You're having to finish out instead of at the rim. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily love that. But uh, – Listen, I, I think I, I thought the, the the fouls that were called for the majority. Now, are officials perfect? No, but I think the fouls that were called honestly were fouls. They were being physical and they were calling fouls. Well, they were calling what they saw. I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I think they got wrong. One was the Jace Carter out of bounds play when yeah. he was making us. Okay, his I, I saw the the picture. His foot didn't go out of bounds. So, and I, and that can be made. That those mistakes can sure. happen. Sure. Wasn't there another one where? Um, the University of Houston player kind of gave it. Um, yeah, and they yeah. called it. Yeah, uh -huh. and, and it didn't go our way, and yep. we asked for the review. And they, I don't. And they, I think they did they review. They did review it and, and said it was just a common foul. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. yeah um, obviously, you wish those. Here's the thing with the Jace Jace one. I'll, I'll speak on that one. That was a huge momentum killer. For yeah, that was a steal. That, that was not about a steal. To, it, been a, it was a turnover. It was though. about to be a turnover for yeah. them, and then it was about to be, uh, uh, you know, a two, at, a two at the other end. And so I can't remember what we were about to be down, like maybe four. I think we were maybe down by six at that point. It was about to be yep. down by four. Um, and so that's a huge momentum killer, you know, for us. Um, and so and and uh, that you, that was tough to see. You can't win a game, though, in my opinion. And they, and they had a chance to win, so maybe I'm wrong. You can't win a game where your best offensive player, and yes, his numbers at the end of the day look pretty good, um, good enough, right? If, you, if you're a box score watcher and you see 21 points, okay, 8 of 9 from the free throw line, 7 rebounds, 3 assists, but you can't win a game like against the University of Houston where you miss free throws and Wade is as um, non-existent as he was for a big uh, part of the game. 
But I think that's what makes Wade special, too, is the fact that he was, and yet he found a way to contribute and be a factor when they needed him down the stretch. Yeah, he shows up in big minutes and uh, in, in big moments, I guess I should say. Um, and that's what you, uh, that's what you want to see. Um, look, you know, his, his shot selection sometimes can be suspect. Mm -hmm. I think we all can see that and we all know that. Um, but you take some of that bad with the good, and the good is that he makes spectacular shots at times. And so, um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, I think in my mind, if you're gonna praise him for the the great made shots, then sometimes you got to live with some of those. Now, some of them are uglier than others. You know, you don't want a 25, 26, yep. 27 footer. Uh, you know, but uh, I I I would I would say that I just um, love his fight. I love how he fought back. Yeah, he didn't have a great first half, but I think the second half, uh, that's just that's Wade Taylor right there. All right, let's hit a break here. When we come back, let's let's look back at uh, Boots Radford's career at A&M, his time here. He's moving on, and, and maybe look ahead of what this team could look like in a world of NIL and transfer. You don't know, but I, I, feel, I feel pretty strong that as long as the, you know, the culture doesn't change, that I think a lot of those guys will be back. So we'll talk about that. We'll get to uh, some more of it here on TechSax Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. All right, welcome into TechSags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Justin Lanham, David Nuno here in this roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. Are they good? Alpha Paving is great. Yeah? Yeah. Definitely. Is Brandon Leone cool? Brandon Leone is really cool. Are you cool? I think I'm pretty cool. I, I think. Know. What, what would you say? I mean, yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, your basketball coverage has been on point, and it's been fun uh, here in Memphis. We're 
ready to get back home. Absolutely. But sad that it's over, I'm, right? I'm real sad that it's over. I've had a great time. Uh, we've had some good meals and uh, had some good time in Memphis. Today. Yeah. And I, look, I really like this basketball team. Yeah. I like the play. Like, I like them. That's not to say that I don't like other – like, but especially when you're, when you're on the ground with them for several days – I really like Manny Obaski. Yeah. I really like Henry Coleman. I really like Wade Taylor. I like Hayden Hefner. I like Jace Carter. Like, I go down the roster. I like Wilden's Levesque, yeah. right? Can I find little uh, areas of their game that I don't love? Yeah, I wish Wilden's Levesque could throw it down a little bit harder sometimes. Sure. Um, I, I wish that Hayden Hefner was a little bit more efficient from three and, and attacked the rim sometimes. Sure. I, I wish, you know, like, I thought Andy Garcia in uh, yesterday's game – the numbers weren't splashy. We're all going to remember the three. But he forced some amazing rebounds. He either got rebounds, he had that behind-the-back pass. Yeah. Like Tip the, outs. the little things that he does mm -hmm. that don't show up. We're all going to talk about the three. But he does so many great things that I think go unnoticed unless you're, like, watching just pure the beauty of basketball. Absolutely. And, and you know, that, that just goes, again, back to – the culture of the team um, and, and how well they play together. They know their role. Um, I think I talked about this uh, a week ago. I, I, I talked about how much I love how they've all embraced their yeah. role um, on the team, and it's just so true. I mean, you watch them, and Anderson Garcia, he doesn't need the fame and, you know, the, the glory from scoring 20 points. He's okay. His, his glory is getting – 15 rebounds and that's like a you know that to him that's what a 30 point uh, outing scoring outing for Wade Taylor is you know so um, I think um, that just shows again the culture of this team so I, I, I really love what he did tonight he had some big tip outs huge um, he only had five rebounds but the, I mean the tip outs I think they're keeping the ball alive yep and that's that's not going to show up on a on a stat sheet yep. right you know but uh, you know he's just doing the little things to uh, to give a and a chance to win so I, I talked to Hop in our post-game wrap, and look, I've said this for a while, and I said this before entering this tournament. To me, you want to be a legend, an A&M legend. You want to be an AC Law, right? You want to be a Joseph Jones. It's not just about the numbers. It's what you do in March, yep. okay? Yep. And Wade Taylor's had those moments, right? He had his NIT run. Um, he had the big game against Nebraska. Like, he's, ha he's had his moments. We're going to remember Wade, and hopefully he's at a and for a couple more years. Yep. Um, and we're going to get to one that we're really going to remember. But Anderson Garcia, that three, is not the biggest three in A&M history. Yeah. But it's going to be one of the three to four, and, I, and I, I don't have the list in front of me, but maybe number two, number three of all yeah. time. And just because they didn't win. If they win that game, yeah. it may surpass ACs. I yeah. don't know if it does, but it might. Yeah, you know, it doesn't surpass the shot, I don't think, of, of, of ACs. But uh, I'll tell you, when that shot went in, that's the first thing I thought about. Well, the way they celebrated, it made me feel like, am I stupid? Did we just Did win, we the game? win the game? Did we win the game? Like, I was like, wait. Yeah. But, but, by the way, I would have celebrated the same way. I'm not sure. – I'm just saying, like, it, it, like, the way Houston looks so dejected. Yes. And the way, like – I was like, hold on. It almost felt like we dogpiled him. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> and, and I'm like, maybe, maybe we – did I just see the score wrong? And yeah. maybe we – because it felt that way. Or what it felt like was like, all right, Houston, what do you got now? Yeah. You got four guys with four fouls. Yeah. Right? Well, and I loved it, too, because it was like we had all the momentum, you know, yeah. and it felt like, uh, like you just said, it felt like Houston was dejected. It felt like they were like, you know, and they had so many fouls. That, that's where my mind went is they were in, fa like, foul trouble. Look at this. Five fouls, five fouls, five fouls, five fouls. Three guys foul out, and then uh, of their starters, uh, uh, somebody with four. Yeah. No, and that's where my mind immediately went is – Force this thing into overtime. Yep. If you could have forced it into double overtime, you really would have got them because they wouldn't have had enough guys to play. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, uh, back to the shot, you know, I, I, like, like you said, I think if, if that's a game-winning shot, obviously now we're talking potentially, you know, number one. If you beat Houston, uh, an in-state rival, number one seed on a last-second three, mm -hmm. it surpasses AC. But yep. that's, not, that's not what happened. Yeah. You force overtime, it's still going to be in the top three of all time. I, look, it may be number two. I, I, yeah. Recent memory, I can't. Yeah. Well, and not to mention from a guy that hasn't taken many. How many threes has he taken right. this year? You know, I mean, not, not many at all. So the fadeaway, he's leaning back. You know, I mean, just the moment was so big. So his basketball IQ is just off the charts. I mean, and that's, that's not necessarily an IQ, that's just a, a great moment. But like the plays that he makes, 
how he opens up players, the way he attacks the rim, the way he, his touch around the basket, the way he can do these behind-the-back passes. He's just a smart, smart player. Yeah, and I think Buzz has talked about that too, about how he'll come up to Buzz and practice and talk about rebounding yep. and just kind of the art of rebounding. And, um, you know, the, the documentary with Michael Jordan, um, I think Rodman used to talk about that, you know, about how yep. – how he would study where the ball is coming from and where it's going to be. And, you know, majority of shots, you know, come off the backside and things like that. And so I think that just shows his maturity. Um, and, and um, golly, I, I really do love that kid. Uh, just the, the amount of, of times that you just think like, yeah, we don't, have a, we don't have a chance to get that rebound. And what do you know? Anderson comes away with it. 20, uh, excuse me, 49 total rebounds. 26 second chance points, excuse me, 26 second chance points, and also 26 offensive rebounds. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that, I think Buzz said it might be a record for them. Yeah, and then tell me this, you may have it there, tell me this, how many extra shots did we get than Houston? How many field goal, extra field goal attempts did we have than Houston? So A&M took 75 field goals to Houston 66. Yeah, and that's listen. That's why that's why that stat right there to me is why A and M has a chance, and I'll tell you why. And that's because when you we didn't shoot the ball well tonight, we didn't shoot the ball thirty nine percent to Houston's fifty two. Yep, that's the difference in the game. We couldn't cover Houston's offense. Yep, and so when you're not shooting the ball well, what do you have to have? Well, you have to have extra. You have you have to have more shots than they have. You know what's amazing to me. A&M shot the three ball better than Houston. It felt like Houston hit every three they ever took. <laughs> if they took 53s, they made 53s. I know that's not what happened. They hit 11 of 34. Uh, yeah, 34 threes. Goodness gracious. Well, I felt like Emmanuel Sharp hit about 53 yeah. tonight is what it felt like. Every time uh, you know they kicked the ball out to him, it felt like it was going in. So. And Houston, by the way, again, it, it, it all happens in the flow of a game. 70% from the free throw line, A&M 64%. It felt like Houston never missed a free throw. I know at the end they missed a couple here. Yep. But the, the reality is the numbers became the, the numbers. Yep. Um, but it's just, I guess, when A&M missed their free throws and when A&M missed their three-point shots. Yeah, and that can make or break a run. And we all know basketball is a game of runs. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I saw a, a – a stat on uh, Twitter or X, whatever you want to refer to it. That's it's still Twitter to me. Uh, yeah, that's what I call it too. Um, you know, I saw a, a statistic that, uh, you know, Houston is, I think, number one in the country for amount of runs, like mm -hmm. big runs, like I think 10-0 runs and stuff like that. So, um, you know, uh, again, basketball is a game of runs, and especially with Houston, you know what you're going to get. So you can't be missing free throws when some of those free throws are breaking up their run, yep. essentially. Yeah, no doubt about that. Here's an interesting one because, you know, by the way, I think Houston's defense is superior. It's fantastic. Uh, A&M's defense struggled on the night to stop individual players. But only five fast break points. Is, that, is this where to go? Yeah, there it is. Five fast break points for A&M, only four for the University of Houston. So uh, two teams that scored a lot of points, 95 to 90, or excuse me, 95 to 100, only five fast break points for A&M and four for Houston. That's an interesting statistic for it to be such a high scoring game. Um, but that also means that there was probably a lot of stoppage um, and you're scoring a lot of points when the when the time is stopped, when the clock is stopped. So free throws um, and, and, and things like that. So, um, but that just speaks volumes for both teams of how well they get back in transition mm -hmm. and that they're just really well coached teams. Um, and uh, they, I, I noticed they were really getting back on Wade and basically turning their back to the rest of the floor, not necessarily face guarding completely Wade, but I felt like they were really trying to keep anytime Wade was in the corner without the ball, their, their back was to the, to, to the, to the ball and they were just trying to keep him there and it worked. Jamal said, Fantastic defensive player. Yeah. But his numbers, by the way, similar to Wade's. I'm just telling you, like, I mean, he, he was more efficient than Wade. 21 points to Wade's 21 points. Wade was 5 of 26. That's bad. Uh, but he was 0 of 5 from 3. Wade was only 3 of 13. Well, I'll tell you this. The thing that, that was tough for me to see at times, and I saw Solomon Washington shaking his head because he was I think he was thinking what I was thinking in the moment. Late in the game, we put Solomon on him. And they would just set a ball screen, and then we would just kind of easily switch off of it. Mm -hmm. And Solomon, could, you could tell he wanted to guard Jamal yeah. Shedd. And I think he should have. 
I think Jamal was having a much tougher time whenever he had the length on him to score and get to the basket. And so um, I thought Jamal, for the most part, any time he wanted to get to the basket, he was going to get to the basket and, and either get to the basket or make a pass off of it. And I think that that's what really hurt us. All right, let's do this. We promise to talk boots. we got to pay off that tease. Yep. Let's close out with two things in the next segment. Let's talk boots. Okay. Think about his legacy at A&M. Yep. All right, and then let's look ahead at this team. If it stays as – they're currently built, and they play the portal game correctly. Let's say they play the portal game the way they did with Dexter Dennis, that version of the portal game. All right, yep. let's say they do that. What does this team look like next year? We'll get into that and more here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. This uh, roadshow brought to you by who? Alpha Paving. We'll be back. All right, friends, it's now time to end the day with Double Dave's color number 12, 979-693-1150. We're going to hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's. They've been serving Aggie Land since 1984 with your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls, reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDave's.com and your favorites are on the way. As a reminder, they are not open on Mondays. Tech Sacks Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, and this uh, roadshow brought to you by... Alpha Paving. So you didn't know you were going to have to do the sponsor part as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, here we go. All right, so we're going to finally pay off the tease. When we think about Boots Radford and what he's done the, the last three years here at Texas A&M, his legacy, the way we're going to look at him, um, just, you know, just I don't know if he's the heart and soul of the team because there's a lot of those, but he certainly 
Manny Obasky told me he's my big brother. He taught me how it is to be a college basketball player. Yeah, you know, I saw the, you know the, one of the interviews um, on Twitter mm-hmm. after the game, um, and they interviewed him in the locker room, and it's tough to see because you could tell that it, it meant a lot to him, yeah. and, it, and he cares um, about this team. He cares about his teammates, the coaches, this program, and this university. And, um, man, he did, he did so much for A&M. Um, just a, a fantastic kid. And, and just the way, that, uh, the way that he played the game was so fun uh, to, to watch. And, and we're definitely going to miss him. I, I love, like, whenever he drives in and he gets to his left hand, you almost feel like it's automatic. Right. Like, you feel like, man, there's no way he's, he's missing this shot, you know. And so just the acrobatic finishes, um, whenever he's out on the floor, and on the court, you know and you feel like a has got a chance tonight. And so definitely going to miss him for sure. When we think about some of the best players that this program has had over the last 20 years, right? You think of the A.C. Laws. You think of the Josh Carters. You think of um, Joseph Kirk. Jones, Dominique Kirk, right? Alex Caruso. There's a lot of names, right? Yeah. Boots Radford is on that list. Yeah. No, he, he definitely stacks up there uh, with the best of them. And Logan Lee. I forgot to mention that one. Logan Lee, baby, yeah. Um, no, he – he definitely stacks up there, um, and that's just a testament to, to who he is and what he's done because that's a, that's a big-time list. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, some of those guys uh, played in the NBA, Donald Sloan, you know, all the, all the, all the players that, that we could name, you know, and he definitely stacks up there with them. So, um, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of had a loss for words just because you just hate it because you know that he's not going to be here next year. And so that's a big void that I feel like you have to, to fill. Um, and um, here's the thing, too, that's tough about replacing a guy like him. He gets it done in multiple ways, yep. you know, and so it's not like you're just replacing one thing. You're replacing multiple things. Let me tell you why I'm, a, I'm not okay with him. I mean, it's, it's part of life, right? They graduate, they move on, right? <laughs> right. So, so uh, you have to stay <laughs> yeah. in college. Yeah. No, but let me tell you why it's a little easier to stomach because the emergence of Manny. Yeah. Because Manny, like – if Manny doesn't have this resurgence of his career at the end of the season, the last nine games, then you're going into this season trying to not only replace Dexter Dennis from two years ago, you're trying to replace Boots Radford. By Manny kind of asserting himself here, all right, now you can go find, you can find another Boots level player, you can find a Dexter Dennis level, but the, with Manny's emergence, I feel like it, it softens what you're going to lose because there, there's similar types of players that attack the rim and are physical and strong. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you feel like with Manny, you can attack or you can you can replace the attacking part of Boots. Okay, well now let's replace the shooting. And and look, Boots was a much better attacker and scorer on the on the on penetration, you know, on drives than he is from shooting outside. Yeah. Um, but he does have the ability to stretch the floor too. So um, I think Manny replaces the the part of the Boots's game where he attacks the attacks the basket, now we've got to find somebody that can stretch the floor and shoot the ball well. Um, and so is that going to be hard to find? Sure. I think we thought we were finding that in a couple of guys in the transfer portal last year. Um, it didn't pan out as much as we wanted it to, so I still think that that's going to be a focus in the transfer portal, or should be. All right, so understanding the transfer portal is a thing, and understanding the, the where college athletics are. I feel, and tell me if I'm wrong, Justin, I don't know why I addressed the camera, and not you. <laughs> yeah. But tell me why I'm wrong, Justin. I, f- I feel like when this type of team, a Buzz Williams type of team, I'm, I have to give Buzz credit on this. Sure. He does create a culture and a family. All right, y'all. Had to cut that a little short as David gave me a little extra content. But if you want to hear the rest of it, go check out our podcast feed on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Check out the full show. Got about 10 minutes worth of content on the back end of that as they continue to break down the A&M U of H game. And uh, for us here at Tech Sags, that'll do it for the show. On the other side, you'll have Louis Bellina. David Nuno will be back in studio tomorrow talking all things uh, Aggie basketball, recapping the season, a little bit of Aggie baseball, Aggie softball, all that good stuff. Uh, And as David says, we'll see you manana.